Good evening, everybody. Sorry about the slight delay, uh, inevitably IT issues, but we will start. There are no fire alarms scheduled for this evening. Therefore, if the fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the building immediately. The fire exits are lo located at the corners of this room and you'll leave either through the front door or there's a door to the back. We meet in the Memorial Park. The meeting is being webcast live on the internet and will be available to view on YouTube after the meeting. Please switch off your mobile phones or turn them to silent. Thank you. For the benefit of members of the public watching or participating in this meeting, I would like to explain who everyone is. My name is Councillor Nick Robinson and I am Chairman of this committee. To my right and left are councillors who will be making decisions on the applications in this evening's agenda. To my immediate right and left are officers who will be presenting the applications and providing advice to the committee. The Development Control Committee is a regulatory committee, not a political meeting. The committee will be considering the published papers, examining the evidence brought before us tonight and will make decisions based on planning reasons. We are guided by national and local planning policy and guidance. At the appropriate time, I will invite speakers to contribute to the meeting in the order set out in the update paper. May I ask all speakers, including visiting members, to speak clearly and keep to the points made to, on the application on material reasons only. No further dialogue between members of the committee and speakers will be permitted once questioning has finished. All speakers will be reminded of their permitted speaking time and will be advised when they have one minute remaining. May I ask all committee members to avoid repetition and keep any comments on each planning application to a maximum of four minutes. This evening we have seven items on the agenda, so we should be able to do it within three hours. I understand that planning can be emotive and ask that everyone remains polite and professional throughout this meeting. Thank you. Right. Apologies for absence and substitution. I have an apology from Councillor Tomlin. And I have Councillor Tilbury um, substituting for Councillor Harvey. And I have Councillor Konechko substituting for Councillor Hussey. I don't see any others, so we'll take that as is. Declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? Councillor Frost. Thank you, Chair. Item four. And you will be leaving the meeting for that item. Yes, Chair, I will. Thank you. Urgent matters, I have none. Um, I don't think anybody else has. No? Good. Minutes of the meeting held on the 27th of October and the 10th of November. Has everybody read them and content with both of them? Could I have a proposer? Councillor Leakes and a seconder, Councillor Ganesh. Um, everybody happy? Agreed. Wonderful. Thank you. Applications for planning. Oh, right. First item is Central 37, formerly Laylam Healthcare, Kingsclear Road, Norden. If we could have Paul Basham and Kevin Deval to the speaker's chairs, please. And if you just wait there whilst the uh, officer introduces the case. Thank you. Please, sir. Thank you, Chair. This is an outline application for up to 75 dwellings um, with the principle of development and means of access only for consideration at this stage. The proposal includes the demolition of the existing former Leyland Warehouse building on the site and the redevelopment of the Brownfield site located close to the town centre for residential development. 
Members will note from the paper that the site is located within a strategic employment area and that was identified when the local, current local plan was prepared. The site is now vacant. Uh, I'll draw members' attention to the update paper. Um, there are notes there from the recent viewing panel that was undertaken. Um, and you will note that the agent has submitted a summary response to comments made by third parties. And there have been two minor, um, some minor wording to two of the conditions, number 29 and 31, to allow demolition groundworks and site preparation works. Illustrative plans have been submitted showing um, one way in which the site could accommodate the contour of development proposed. You're being asked under this application whether 75 units could be accommodated within the, within the site boundaries. Um, it's, uh, whilst the um, illustrative plans are, just as they are, are not um, forming part of the uh, you know, final um, scheme, they do show one way, and it is likely that that number of units would, would require um, a, an element of flatted development over a number of storeys. Um, so whilst the indicative ele elevations show um, a sort of five-storey building, um, it, it could be that you, you, know, you may have a, a lesser number of um, storeys, but that might in turn mean that you would have um, possibly only a um, very small number of um, bed units. You'll note from the papers that the mix here is of one and two bed um, units, which complies with policy uh, CN3. Um, you'll note as well that the scheme has evolved um, following officer comments made both at the pre-application stage and throughout the course of this application, such that officers are now satisfied that the scheme uh, is acceptable and the recommendation is therefore for approval, subject to the completion of a 106 agreement for the matter set out in the paper and the conditions also within the main paper with the amended condition wording that I've already referred to. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Mr. Basham, Mr. Deval, you have four minutes between you. I will warn you when you have one minute left. Um, please go ahead. Sorry? How you split them between you is entirely up to you. Good evening. My name is Kevin Dival. I'm the licensee of the Rise and Sun Public House on Chapel Hill, which has been on the site for 200 years next year. The provoked development backs directly onto the pub and it will dwarf the beer garden, which is used extensively, especially in the warmer months. As a pub landlord, I've had many conversations with locals and neighbours. There is a lot of concern for the development, and I'd like it noted that there's 48 objections on the planning website and none supportive. I strongly disagree with some of the planning officer's recommendations. I, the proposed development would not result in undue loss of privacy or due cause due overlooking, overshadowing or overbearing of noise. Currently, the pub garden is very private. It's not directly overlooked by any residential properties. The proposed development will be, impose, will be imposing 60% higher than the existing warehouse, so from three to five storeys. As a result, the over overshadow the pub garden impacting light significant proportion of the balconies and windows would directly overlook the garden destroying the privacy and similar issues for Dexter Court second point noise impacts can be controlled ensure that the proposed development would not cause harm to living conditions this does not address the points raised by myself or environmental health that the business has an equal right to continue its operation under its current model the council's own environmental officer stated planning and licensing methodologies for assessing noise are totally different. They have also stated there's a high risk of the expectations between future residents are in conflict with the current activities of the rising sun. The outcome of that will be potential licensing conditions on, on the pub and the use of the garden. I'll, I'll finish my hand over, Paul. Thank you. I'm Paul Basham, I'm on Cromwell Road. This proposal fails to meet four local plan policies and a national planning policy framework. Many of the local objections can be traced back to the height and cramming in of this proposal. Lara Cakel Harding of Leander Court says that she will lose significant amenity through reductions in light and privacy, overshadowed and overlooked by a bigger building. 
I regularly walk my dog through the cemetery. The current industrial unit sits on the skyline so that you can still see Clidston. A 60% increase in, evaluate, in evaluation elevation will obscure that view. So much so we will have to rename Southview because it will be gone. The pub has a right to continue its business where customers can enjoy the beer garden and summer events. Paragraph 187 of the National Policy Planning Framework says existing businesses and facilities should not have unreasonable restrictions placed on them as a result of development permitted after they were established. A single noise complaint is enough to stop event licensing. Vivid offers no mitigation that can stop this. Contravening you have policy one minute. 12 pollution and failing adhere to the NPPF. It contravenes policy EM11, the historic environment. Debbie Reeval, Secretary of the Bainstoke Heritage Society says, significant work was done with officers to achieve designation of the conservation area. The 13th century cemetery and the ruins of the two chapels are landmarks. The proposal will look intrusive and monstrous from the ancient monuments, monument site. It will tower over the 200 year old pub. It nullifies the good work done by Vivid to preserve the white building and the visual quality of the surrounding housing on Chapel Gate. The town's heritage deserves respect. I don't have time to read out policy EM10, delivering high quality development. Suffice to say, it fails the first three policy requirements regarding character, amenity and heritage. Finally, the proposal does not meet minimum standards for multifunctional green space. We already have a deficit in Norden. It fails policy EM5, green infrastructure. I met Vivid's commercial director, Jonathan Cowie, recently. He said that Vivid's aspiration was to create livable spaces. I will leave you to consider what is livable for residents with noise pollution, a lack of green space, and access to a road with no pavement, and a blind eye to amenity and heritage. Thank you. Can you just turn the microphone off, please? Councillors, questions to the speakers? Councillor Ganesh, uh, Gaskell, sorry. Hi, um, can I just ask, has there been any public participation event from, from the developer to try and communicate with any residents or local residents? Uh, the ones I do know... Could you use the microphone, please? Sorry, the one I do know of from the, the original consultation, they said, that, which I believe was a mail shot, although I, as the Rising Sun, had no mail shot from them. It took me three attempts to actually get a meeting, a call set up to discuss anything. And to be quite honest, the complaints and issues we raised have not been addressed by any changes in those plans. The plans were put in as is. Any more questions? No? Thank you, gentlemen. If you could just wipe down the edge of the table and the microphone button and the arms of your uh, chairs, I'm sure the... Uh, Next speaker will appreciate it. And next speaker is Hannah Pierce. Good evening. You hope we'll have four minutes. The microphone button is in front of you. I'll warn you when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Hannah Pierce, planning agent acting on behalf of Vivid as the applicant. The application is in outline form where only the principle of residential use and the access is to be considered at this stage. As noted by your officers, the district lacks a five-year housing land supply. Therefore, relevant housing policies of the local plan are out of date and the tilted balance of the MPPF applies. Here, government policy makes it clear that sustainable developments such as this should be approved unless adverse impacts significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. In terms of potential impacts, there are three main matters for consideration. I take each in turn. The site is located within an SEA, but its context has significantly changed, and the site is now surrounded by residential uses. This is recognised by your officers who agree that the site is no longer suitable for an employment or logistics use, particularly as it's not well connected to the strategic, strategic sorry, road network and is at odds with its surroundings. Vivid have received complaints from, res from residents at Chapelgate and Dexter Court about lorries accessing the site and general noise and congestion concerns from the previous use. The loss of an employment use is accepted in principle by your officers. Concerns have been raised about harmful impact on the conservation area and notable buildings. The actual layout and design will be considered at a later stage, but based on the illustrative site layout, your officers have confirmed that the proposals are unlikely to result in an overbearing relationship with the Rising Sun pub, and any harm to the conservation area will be at the lower end of less than substantial. There are no adverse heritage impacts to weigh against the proposals. It has been suggested that future residents would have cause for complaint of noise arising from the pub and particularly from outdoor events. 
although Vivid are not aware of any complaints from their residents in the last three years. The noise impacts relating to the pub have been assessed by the um, applicant and any noise can be appropriately managed and mitigated through the use of mechanical ventilation, cooling and heating. Your officers have confirmed that they have no outstanding objections to the proposals subject to the conditions being imposed that require that mitigation. There are a number of benefits to the proposal which clearly outweigh any perceived adverse impacts. The development is in the town centre and makes efficient use of previously developed land. Mm -hmm. The site is in a highly su sustainable and accessible location and delivery of housing in this urban context reduces pressure on greenfield land. It will contribute up to 75 new homes to the housing supply, which is a significant benefit as per recent appeal decisions. At least 40% of the apartments will be affordable and your housing officer supports the scheme, highlighting a need for two bed family size units as well as one bed, which this scheme will deliver. The apartments meet with all national space standards and generous circulation and storage is provided. Open space is provided on site with the minimum quantity of MFGS met and a kickabout area included. All apartments have some private space, which is a direct response to the COVID pandemic. The proposal will deliver biodiversity enhancement and will generate economic value. The new access offers benefit by rationalising the number of access points to the site and increasing separation distance to the roundabout. There will also be a reduction in traffic flow compared with the existing use. You have Re one minute. Removal of HDBs to the site will have further significant benefits and help to reduce congestion on the roundabout. Additional pavements will vastly improve safety for pedestrians and will assist in creating safe walking routes to nearby schools, although to date none of Vivid's residents have lodged complaints about this. Sufficient provision is made for car parking and your highways officer raised no objections. There will be no material traffic impact and a safe and suitable access is provided. In conclusion, the principle of residential use on the site is clearly accepted against this background. The detailed design will be appraised at the reserve matters stage, but in the meantime, it is demonstrated that up to 75 units can successfully be accommodated. The proposals provide significant benefits which outweigh any adverse impacts in the planning balance. I ask you to back this proposal which provide much needed housing for Basingstoke in a sustainable and suitable location. Thank you. Thank you. Could you turn your microphone off, yes. please? Questions for the speaker? Okay, I see no hands. I've got one. The indicative layout that you've shown shows it as being five storey. Could you deliver that number of units without going to five storey? So the indicative proposals at the moment show uh, five, the fifth storey is being recessed. I think it would be difficult to provide apartments of the size that we would want to provide across a, a lower height building, but this is only one potential proposed design um, and that will obviously be considered through the reserve matter stages. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? No, thank you very much. If you could wipe down before you leave as well, please. And next speakers, I've got Councillor Woodridge, Councillor James and Councillor Harvey. Um, who wants to come up first? <laughs> Good evening, Councillor Waldridge. You have four minutes, and I will warn you when you have one minute left. Thank you, Chair. It's very disappointing that Vivid brought forward this planning application, a mass of 75 flats in one block over five storeys, despite concerns raised in the pre-act stage from myself, others, and the local community. There, there are many reasons to question this application. I'd like to focus on the following. Firstly, the failure of the application to meet the EM5 green, uh, green infrastructure and open space requirements. F uh, parks and open space officers are quite clear that these requirements have not been met. Norden already has an underprovision of open space, and in the previous Chapel Gate development, Vivid was scraping around to meet open space requirements, using strips of grass around parking bays to justify the total. So the reliance in this application of making off-site contributions for the upkeep, upkeep and management of other open spaces as, as an alternative to proper provision, it, to me, is unacceptable. Secondly, I have concerns that the application does not meet the uh, CN3 housing mix due to the high number of two-bed flats on upper floors being proposed. Uh, at a scrutiny meeting on the 21st of September, officers asked us to review the allocations policy 
they were seeking views from members about using two bed upper floor flats for single people as the demand for them had fallen. So why, in which case are we bringing forward an application which is going to be pretty much looking at two bed flats on, on upper levels? Thirdly, it's questionable if application, this application meets the EM10 delivery of a high quality development. It's a five storey block and it's out, of, it's out of keeping with the distinct character of Southview. I have particular concerns about the views from the Southview Cemetery, one of the most tranquil places in the urban area of the town and highly valued by residents. Next, uh, the policy CN9, Transport. Many residents have made justifiable concerns about access arrangements, road congestion and road safety concerns. The situation is already perilous, especially at peak times, uh, the, uh, at the Sherburn Road roundabout and going up Sherburn Road. Despite Hampshire Highways acknowledging this and working with us on plans to improve safety, nothing has been delivered except broken promises on pigeon proofing. And so it's disappointing to see that Hampshire Highways haven't um, uh, acknowledged that in the um, transport information. Finally, infrastructure, CN6. It's very disappointing that by bringing forward a fully flatted development, Vivid will avoid making sealed contributions for much needed infrastructure. Schools are, are, are already oversubscribed. Um, I've had one case in Chapelgate where a child was having to be homeschooled because there was no space for her in the school where her siblings attended and the logistics of her parents getting them to different schools were just not possible. You have one minute. So in summary, What's being brought forward, in my opinion, is cramming. It's of too high density. It's in an area already stretched to breaking point. If housing to be, is to be built here, please let's have lower density housing that people want to live in and is in, is in keeping with the Southview area. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Councillor Woldridge, Councillor Frost. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Councillor Woldridge. Um, I'd just like to uh, take you back um, to where you were discussing open spaces and saying that uh, there wasn't enough open spaces. At the bottom of page 81, the Parks and Open Spaces team, and I quote, um, the proposed uh, multifunction green space is below the minimum standard, okay, and it's saying that uh, it should be increased to a minimum of 2,582 uh, metres, okay, and it's saying that the remaining balance is not provided on site and must be provided as an off site contribution. Adequate play facilities exist in the ward and vicinity and are not therefore required for the development. How do you square um, your comment about there not being enough um, open spaces uh, and, uh, and, and, and game spaces? Sorry, I haven't got the report in front of me, but I'm trying to remember what you said. But um, uh, you, can I borrow the report? Sorry. Oh, apologies. Right, sorry. Okay. Eighty-one. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm. <laughs> So, uh, so, 81, 82, right, so, yeah. So, uh, the comments on, on the amended plan said it, it, that it is still unacceptable. It's failure to meet policy EM5, inadequate provision of M MFGC to meet needs of additional residents without adversely affecting quality of life of existing residents. So, basically, it's still saying it's... Over the page, so top of eight. Sorry, Councillor Houtsorrell, this is not so the I, I, I am reading the comments of the amended plans. I'm not reading the original plans. I'm reading the comments of the amended plans. And my interpretation of that, I might be wrong, but it's that it's that it's still the the, the open. The parks officers are still saying it's unacceptable. That's my reading of it. And please <laughs> challenge that if, if you feel it's wrong. But it, I think it's as clear as, as much, well, it's clear to me that that's what they mean. Councillor Woods, I think I mean, we're going to have to move on from this. We're, we're, we're not getting a straight answer to a straight question. Sorry. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not to, 
I'm not trying to criticise, but it's just um, it's not achieving what we need to achieve at this okay. meeting. Yeah. So um, if you could turn the microphone off a moment, please. Um, are there any other questions for Councillor Aldridge? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe Councillor James and Councillor Harvey wish to come up and speak together. You have four minutes each. I will warn you when you have one minute left. Thank you, Chair. We'd like to ask you to reject the application that's before you tonight. It is disappointing that Vivid, who do know the level of objection and concern locally about this proposal, and as a preferred partner of the Council, have chosen to carry on regardless. It is a concern that the partner, such as Vivid, is bringing forward an application in principle rather than a substantive full application. We'd have rather seen these proposals revised with community support for a development people could get behind. Instead, we have a proposal which on scale and massing is a significant departure from the character of the north side of the railway. It is important to note the railway line as a key barrier that it creates. Therefore, the proposal scale and massing is larger than anything else in our ward. Indeed, it is significantly taller than the warehousing currently on site. We do not have blocks of flats like this north of the railway line. Indeed, Chapel Gate is a character that has flats that are broken into smaller blocks that complement the housing. That balance of development in Chapel Gate stands in contrast to this proposal, which is 100% flatted. We feel that the proposal contravenes EM10, as this is not high quality proposal. And as you work through the policy, we say this application fails. We object on EM5 and open space. The officer admits that there is inadequate provision of multifunctional game space, open space on the site, and indeed we are told to expect an off-site contribution to mitigate the impact of this development. When Vivid built Chapel Gate, we had to accept an off-site contribution then for the scale of that development. And here again, Vivid asks us to accept a development that provides less space than required and piles the pressure on our existing open spaces. We should not forget the 60 units with families living in Dextra Court, with no open space because it was a permitted development, again undertaken by Vivid, all piling pressure on our already inadequate existing open spaces. Simply throwing money at existing open spaces and play areas cannot make them bigger. You cannot magic open space out of thin air. They are the size they are. Or to allow them to accommodate more people. EM5 is supposed to be a policy that protects our communities from this kind of deficient development. We need the required space, not as a nice to have, not as some trade off in a balance of planning argument, but as a means to secure the health and well being of our community. We need development that actually offers the open space required, and we have suffered too much development that leaves our ward in deficit. We object to the application as an agent of change. Our environmental health officers could not be clearer stating that conflict will arise between residents and the rising sun. This 200 year old pub is an essential part of our community and it should not be put at risk by this development acting as an agent of change. As our officers say, just one complaint could be enough to given, given the noise levels they identify are associated with the operation of the pub for it to be put under new restrictions and constraints. That would be unacceptable. The idea that people will keep their windows closed in the summer and not use their balconies because they have a mechanical ventilation system which will regulate the air inside the flat is ludicrous. People will open their windows because of the design of the flats. The northern and eastern flanks of the building will be exposed to noise from the pub. There will be conflict and it will be the pub that comes off worst. One minute. The balconies facing the pub, and this is a development as designed and in principle as presented, which is a direct threat to the pub. Our environmental health officers have said so clearly, and their reasoning in full as presented in their consultation response we feel is very important. The NPPF is very clear on this in para, eight, seven, para 187. Planning policies and decisions should ensure that the new development can be integrated effectively with existing businesses and community facilities such as pubs. Existing businesses and facilities should not have unreasonable restrictions placed on them as a result of the development permitted where they are established. Where the operation of an existing business or community facility could have a significant adverse impact on the development, the applicant should be required to provide suitable mitigation before the development has been completed. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Councillor James. We make the point no mitigation can account for the large block of flats where the windows will be open in the summer and the pub's operation will have the, an impact at noise levels our officers say will cause conflict. 
We also object on road safety. We also feel very strongly about the Sherborne Road roundabout. We are deeply disappointed that Hampshire Highways have done a desktop study of an application and the proposal do no account or for the dangers residents currently face on the roundabout. Sometimes it's best to see the human reaction of officers when you show them the issues you see day to day. We st we've stood on the roundabout with officers from Hampshire Highways when they have been horrified at the way traffic, pedestrians and cyclists currently use it. We have all said how dangerous it is. We've stood there and suggested things that need to be done now to deal with the Chapel Gate development, let alone this proposal for the further huge blocks of flats. There is a sense that in-person officers agree with us that action is needed to make the roundabout safe for school children, for cyclists and for mot motorists. This block of flats will house children, families, and as such, they will need to cross round roads to safely access services. If county won't now deliver the Toucan Crossing on Kingsclaw Road promised by Chapel Gate, then we, what hope do we have? We need this to get the development right so that it doesn't cause more of a problem. A study that merely numbers crunches volume of traffic doesn't adequately address the safety concerns we and our community have. South Hugh Residents Association have undertaken surveys that identify the huge number of people walking around the roundabout. They've stood there with near misses and been horrified at what danger county and developers like Vivid have to take responsibility for the roundabout and the consequences that we are living with day in and day out. We have already put so many homes on the south side of Kingsclare Road. They need to access services in our ward. They need safe routes across the roundabout. The less than sustainable harm done by, to the conservation area is dismissed as just that, less than su substantial harm. Um, but it is harm to the oldest part of our town. It is the Holy Ghost Church and cemetery at, at that. Vivid took such great care with Chapel Gate and respected the surrounding character on community. Now we have this huge block of flats landed on this site, which will dominate the sheer scale of any buildings nearby. At the moment, the Holy Ghost Church is the dominant feature of this part of the ward. Members, we accept that development will come on this site, but it is not at any ex is, but it is in, not in any way acceptable that it has to be a huge block of flats. You have as one minute. As currently proposed, how many times have we sat here and asked for houses, townhouses, or, or argued for quality development that delivers a place that we can be proud of? Members, please reject this application and Vivid, please work with the community to develop as something that we can all support. Thank you. Questions for the speakers? Councillor Howard Sorrell. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure who to aim this at because your speech has made quite a few points. Um, uh, the general tone is that this will be negative for the Rising Sun pub. Uh, would not having 75 flats offer a larger customer base? If it's somebody's local, they're a lot more likely to, to go of an evening. Um, also, based on the positioning of the building, um, it's sort of uh, southwest. That shouldn't block sun in the sort of late evening uh, when people are likely to be in a pub garden. So, uh, do you have any, any thoughts around that? No, thank you. I think the important point about the situation with the pub is that currently with Chapel Gate and Dexter Court, you have developments that are far enough away that there have been no complaints regarding noise. If you place this development in its current location as proposed on these indicative plans, and we understand from the developer that these indicative plans are likely to be the plans because there's no way else of getting just even this meagre amount of open space on site. If they try and play with it, they're going to lose that bit of open space. So this is going to be what they eventually submit as the reserve matters. Then what we see is those development, that development will lead to those windows being directly affected by the pub. So we're going to have that pub operating as a normal practice, let alone the beer garden to start with, just its normal practice, which our officers indicate will be noise above the level required for our environmental health officers to take action against the pub. 
If you then put the beer garden in place during summer months, that noise will also be effective, and it will be above the noise required for our environmental health officers to take action against the pub. And they indicate to us that that action they would take are under two different sets of rules. So we have the rules that we're operating under as far as the planning element is concerned, which is totally understandable in terms of noise, but those complaints will be assessed under a different regime. And that regime might well result in the pub receiving constraints or, or different actions taken against it uh, as a result of those complaints. That's the agent of change argument. This development is acting as an agent of change in the context of that pub, and the MPPF specifically says that should not happen. That's our view on it. And to say you're going to get 75 extra residences, if there was a way of achieving a regular development, a development that we could support on this site, that Vivid would work with us to achieve that, not as sheer scale or massing or the sheer number that we're dealing with, be very happy to work with them just like we did on Chapel Gate. That's not what we have in front of us. That's why our community has reacted as much as it has done. If I could just also, in relation to that, is the pub is a really successful pub and um, it's had enormous pre-COVID um, a number of events in the in the beer garden so and they get additional yeah. licenses for that and they're quite noisy and but very popular with the community um, and so it's very likely that there will be and there only needs to be one complaint and if there's one complaint that then will impact on the pub's license but it, it's not just what happens within the pub it's a very large beer garden very large and it has lots of activities and lots of music and live music uh, in the in the pub and you know like Paul said in relation to the MPPF it's very clear that any impact that is going to impact on an existing build an existing business you know you should think again in relation to a development thank you any more questions no thank you very much if you could have a wipe down I'm sure thank you <coughs> Questions to the officers, Councillor Ganesh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question to officers is, um, I clearly understand the planning policies and uh, uh, where environment health uh, can intervene uh, in an existing business by going ahead with this application. Is there anything uh, from planning perspective that can be attached as a condition that in future, no such a condition can't be imposed against the existing business? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not quite clear what, what, what you're asking, sorry. Is it? So the, my question is, is is there any sort of a provision in planning that allow us to have some sort of an attachment that stops or prevents in future the pub being imposed with any sort of a condition by environmental health? Uh, no, that wouldn't be reasonable. Um, we have got conditions in terms of mitigation um, measures um, as recommended by the environmental health team in respect of the, the proposal here, but you, you couldn't put a condition on as, as you suggest. Thank you. Councillor Gaskell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have two questions. Is it okay to do two questions? The first question is, um, it mentions conservation area. Do, do we have a map showing the conservation area and, and what's in it? So the, the conservation area, the site doesn't fall within the conservation area. Um, the, the boundary runs along the edge. Um, including um, the, the edge of the beer garden of the rising sun. So the rising sun is within it. Um, and then everything to the north um, containing the Holy Ghost and, and the cemetery, uh, as you've um, I've heard, um, it is within the conservation area. Your microphone's not on. Oh. Sorry, just just in having a conservation area, um, and the pubs in the con or the beer gardens in the conservation area, aren't we supposed to be conserving that area and what it does and how it functions? 
Yeah, the, the tests, as I've said, and my report, uh, the, the, the 1990 Act, the, the relevant sections 72 and 66, uh, we have a duty to, um, the test is preserve and enhance. Um, and you will note from my report that we have comments from um, both the Historic Environment Team and Historic England we've consulted on as well. Um, and we have acknowledged throughout the report that the there will be a uh, less than substantial harm to the ability to appreciate the significance of the conservation area, but this harm will be the, at the lower level. So throughout the report, we have um, balanced that against the wider benefits of the scheme, um, and <coughs> um, and and you will see in the planning balance section of the report again we have acknowledged that as as there being a harm and therefore some conflict with the M11 the policy, um, but weighing everything in the balance, we've decided um, that we feel the proposal is acceptable because the benefits outweigh those harms. Okay, thank you. And uh, my second question was a follow-on to Councillor Frost's question uh, earlier. Uh, it was just a confusion where you've mentioned, was it page um, 81. 81? Yeah, so you've put down proposed multifunctional green space is below the absolute minimum. And then on the following page, you've put down adequate play facilities exist in the ward vicinity and are not therefore required in this development. So, so there seems to be a, a bit of a cross, cross terms there. Could you explain that, please? Yep, so these are the comments of the Parks and Open Spaces team. So there's a difference between multifunctional green space, which is just as it is, the, the space, and then um, the play uh, facilities. So that is equipped play. Um, so in, on this occasion, the, the, the open space team have said that there is sufficient play facilities within um, that such as not to, to, to justify being um, asked, um, additional being asked for as a result of this. But their comments were in relation to the amount of multifunctional green space. And if you apply, there are two standards. There's, an, there's, there's a quantity standard, then an absolute minimum standard. And they were saying based on the quantity standard, which is what they'd like to achieve on all sites, um, you wouldn't be able to to the site wouldn't be able to accommodate that uh, it would be a much larger um, element about 8,000 square meters I think it was um, and therefore if you then apply the absolute minimum standard which is proposed under this scheme the difference between those two um, is the offside contribution that is proposed as part of the 106 agreement sorry can I just follow that on it's just if we're going to do this offsite contribution and we've already got off-site contributions elsewhere, where are we going to put this off-site um, scheme? It wouldn't be a new scheme. Um, as, as I've um, said there, it's towards public open space um, provision within the area. So it could be, it would be for the Parks and Open Spaces team to decide how they would allocate that spend to what projects they, they, they would um, use that, but it would be in to, towards facilities that are within, within the locale. But, but do we have any work proposed for that? Yeah, Councillor Frost, I think, um, not Frost, <laughs> Councillor Garcia, I think you've had two questions and two supplementaries. I think we need to uh, move on. Councillor Frost. Sorry, I can just answer that because it is actually set out in the report on page 102. White Ditch Playing Fields, Southview Cemetery and or Lyford Road Open Space. Thank you, Jay. I think... Uh, there's quite a difference between uh, Councillor Gaskell and myself. I'm the guy with a grey beard. Councillor Gaskell is, is, the, is the person with the brown beard. Uh, but anyway, I, again, just, just kind of picking up on, on that one particular point, because I'm actually quite confused, um, and I'm, I'm hoping to get some clarity on this. I understand what the Parks No Open Spaces team are saying that's in this, this document, okay? But you've heard from three councillors, okay, that, the, that there is not sufficient facility of um, of the uh, the MFGS okay so I'm just wondering how do we square that yeah as I as I've just explained there are two standards there's the quantity standard at 65 square meters per person and the absolute minimum standard of 20 square uh, square meters per person and based on 75 units and and the proposed mix there is a requirement um, it meets the absolute minimum standards. So therefore, ideally, the Parks and Open Spaces team would like the 65 square metre um, equivalent to be provided, but 
that is not achievable on this site, given the constraints of the site. Um, so, uh, you know, I set out in my report, the minimum is being achieved, although not ideal, when you weigh everything else in the, the, the planning balance, which is what, as officers, we have to do. Um, there is an, an, uh, uh, the absolute minimum being provided in a, a, a space large enough to also provide a kickabout area, which is what the open spaces team wanted. Um, and so therefore, on balance, um, yeah, whilst not, whilst not ideal, um, when you weigh the other be benefits in, we've, we've come down on the side of, of uh, uh, approval. Can I just have a supplementary, please, Chair? I'm, I'm sorry to kind of labour this, and, and you know, I'm, there, there's obviously something I'm, I'm, I'm kind of missing here. But it, it states at the top of page 82 that adequate play facilities exist in the ward and the vicinity and therefore are not required for this development. We've heard from th the three ward councillors okay, that there is an insufficient play facilities. And that's the bit really I'm, I'm kind of wanting to, to kind of understand. Um, yeah, um, with, respect, with respect, I think they're referring to the level of open space. They're not referring to play facilities. As I said earlier, the difference is that open space is the space with the kickabout area. Play facilities are the actual pieces of equipment, so equipped play. So the Parks and Open Spaces team have said to me there is no requirement for actual physical play equipment to be provided on this site, but there is a requirement to provide an overall area of open space. So that, that I, I know it's, it's quite confusing because of the different terminology, but um, I'm sorry if I, my report wasn't clear in that regard. I think you know, your report was quite clear, and thank you very much because it seemed to be quite comprehensive. Uh, I was just maybe misunderstanding. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Frost. Anybody else with questions for the officers? I've got one regarding the conservation area. Am I right in my recollection that views to and from a conservation area are to be considered, not just the views within the conservation area. Uh, yes, you're correct, and um, and that is how the uh, historic environment team have assessed it. And it's it's the ability to appreciate the significance of the conservation. So it's in you know whether you're outside of it, you still can appreciate it. So you're correct. Thank you. I see no hands up for questions to officers. So we move to a debate. Councillor Goderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, if I just may, may, might make a brief point, I've, I've been involved for over 40 years in running restaurants and pubs, and therefore I can, I, I can state quite categorically that if this development t takes place and is built as per, per plan, then there will certainly be a raft of complaints against the pub without any doubt whatsoever. And if those rafts of, of, of complaint are, are deemed by the borough to uh, constitute a public nuisance, which it might well do after a period of time, then, then, then unfortunately the, the matter would need to be referred to the licensing committee who would then have to consider whether they wanted to alter the pub's uh, license to operate. Thank you. Councillor Ganesh. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so we keep hearing the the wording of this application deliver the bare minimum. So we keep hearing that okay, this is twenty meters per uh, square per person, and this deliver it. What uh, the the maximum could be about sixty five, but that can't be. But we are happy to go with that twenty meter per squ uh, meter square per person. And the the other statement we've been hearing is. Uh, uh, the benefits outweigh the harms, but what we're trying to do is uh, the accumulating the harm. So the the overall view of this planning application will have massive impact on an existing business that probably might be forced to shut. And we've still got some uh, questions around the open space. And I'm not sure or I'm not really uh, uh, sort of convinced with the transport studies that clear early says that uh, it has all the mitigations uh, for the number of houses that will be provided in that area. So I'm still open to see what uh, the committee is uh, looking to. Thank you. Councillor Tilbury. 
Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, the comments on the amended plans from our Parks and Open Space team is that it's unacceptable. It's, you know, pretty clear. And also they go on to say that you may do other things which help to mitigate the negative impact. But the point is it's unacceptable and it's negative. And this is not very clever at all, really, is it? I mean, that's the, the conservation area does go, includes the whole of the rising sun, and it will impact on that. The Holy Ghost ruins are one of the few things in Basingstoke that do stand out, you know, and they are on a hill. So building this in front of them isn't going to do much to improve that. I mean, you made the point about views in and out there. You know, you can see them from the other side of the town at the moment. Also, you can see the massive Sainsbury's warehouse, but that's, you know, that just because we've ruined one part of it, doesn't mean we have to ruin the rest. I mean, it's interesting looking at those pictures that they managed to make the open space look enormous, don't they? And the five-story block of flats looks quite tiny, doesn't it? It's a very interesting perspective, isn't it? It's a, they're like estate agents, you know, managed to make things look enormous. But, I mean, the issue is, the whole point of the issue around the pub is that the planning, you should not be in a situation where your planning creates a problem for an existing premise. That's clear in the MPPF. Because if you do that, once you've built it, then you can get the noise complaints. We've seen that in my own war with the, you know, Bombay Sapper, where you know you had an existing building, been a factory for years. They built houses in front of on a garage full court and complaints from the neighbours. And it, the borough spent a fortune. You know, we're the ones who will end, we'll end up paying all this as well. You know, we have to pay for noise complaints, environmental health to go in there, deal with these issues because they are dealt with completely differently. And the point is. This should be dealt with at the planning stage. You know, if it's going to cause a problem, you wouldn't allow planning to go forward in that stage. And I don't see how you can mitigate this. You put it right next to it. And it doesn't help that this is an outline. You know, if it, it's probably going to be what it's going to look like there. And they've tried to move it away. But, you know, you could mitigate it completely by building them all underground, couldn't you? But you could get 75 properties on it by doing something extreme like that. But the reality is, is whatever you put on here is going to cause problems. So it's, you've got to be ensure it's built properly in the first place and this clearly this isn't going to do it the higher you put up people the more the noise will carry it will reverberate around i mean it's actually the way the building's been put it's l-shaped so it will act as a it will tend to trap the noise wouldn't it it'd be better if it was round the other way it was l-shaped the opposite direction you know basic stuff like that i mean they used to build things like that so you could hear airplanes coming before the second world war and they were shaped like that so to trap it funnels the noise in well that that will exactly what this would do so there are ways you could minimise this, but the reality is it's just too big. Five storeys will dominate. I mean, the warehouses are not attractive, you know, but it, it was, this was one of our prime industrial sites until we allowed them to drive a wedge in with the Eli Lilly's building. We said that I was on the committee at that time with the original Lemon Land proposals. Once we drove that in there, it's caused a negative impact on all our business in that area and driven those out. And I think the applicant suggested it would say building on a greenfield site. Well, it won't because all that's going to happen is the warehouse will go on the greenfield site. And given the choice, I suspect the residents will probably live on a greenfield site in preference to living next to a railway line and a possibly potentially noisy pub. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Frost. Thank you, Chair. I've, I've listened to the debate so far and, uh, and I think there are a lot of concerns on both sides of the, uh, um, of the chamber here. I would like to propose a motion, okay, right now, okay, uh, just to avoid any uh, any doubt that um, we refuse this uh, this planning application, and the grounds for refusal are failure to meet EM5 in the MFGS, and also uh, on the grounds of landscape, uh, where there are concerns uh, regarding the, the visual intrusion of a five-story block of flat. Thank you, Councillor Frost. Anybody feel like seconding that? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Freeman, I'll pick one at random. <laughs> yes, happy to second. Thank you. Councillor Konechka. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Can we also add into that motion the point about the, the pub and the, that potentially um, being contravent, contravention of the MPPPF? Because I think that's quite a strong point as well. I'm happy to accept that. Thank you. Um, and I would, with Councillor Frost's agreement, 
like to add in the effect on the conservation area. Um, I think it affects views from the conservation area. I'm happy to accept that one as well, Chair. Thank you. It's been proposed and seconded for refusal. Those in favour of... Oh, so we'll go to Lisa for a moment. Sorry, Chair, I just, I, I just wanted to make a point. Um, with regards to the second um, uh, suggestion by Councillor Foss regarding the visual intrusion, obviously the plans before you are indicative. Um, so what I think you are saying um, is that the, given the number of units that are being proposed, it's the quantum of development that you feel could not be accommodated sufficiently within, within the site because the scale would be such that it would, it would inevitably it result in, an, an, in a number of storeys high which would then be visually intrusive. Because the plans before you are indicative, they're not for consideration. So it, you're looking at the number of, of dwellings. And I'm happy um, to reduce the number of dwellings, you know, um, or to say that we object on the, on the, uh, on the number of, uh, of dwellings, but in particular on the number of stories that are proposed. Sorry, sorry, we, we don't know that those, those, those plans are indicative, so you couldn't put a number on the, to say a, a five story unit. It, you, ha you have to sell, given the number of units, that are being proposed, 75, can those be accommodated on the site? Um, so you might you, you might say, we don't think that that level of units could be accommodated on the site because it could, it because of the size of the site, it would have to be accommodated within a footprint of a building that may result in a number of stories. But you, you can't say, that, like, like I say, those plans are, are, are illustrative, just to give an indication of one way in which they could be accommodated. So we, I, I think the simplest thing is that, um, as Lisa says, they're illustrated plans only. I think the easiest way to describe that reason for refusal is it's overdevelopment of this site in terms of the quantum that's proposed, which, and as, as a result, it would be out of keeping the scale and character with the surrounding area, and you keep it as simple as that. Thank you, Sue. I'll, I'll accept Sue's version, even though the report specifically says okay, that there are uh, concerns regarding a five-storey block of flats there. But I, I will happily accept Sue's version. I think we've got there in the end. <laughs> okay, it's been proposed and seconded for refusal. Those in favour of refusal? That's unanimous. Thank you. That is refused. Lisa, if you'd like to confirm. Yeah, so um, refused on the uh, grounds of uh, conflict with policy EMF, EM5 in relation to MFGS, the overdevelopment uh, scale and character um, impact on the adjoining pub, um, contrary to the MPPF, and impact on views to, from, and within the conservation area, contrary to P, policy EM11 of the local plan. Thank you, everyone. Item two. Land to the rear of Rose Len, Berrywood Lane, Bradley. If we could have Caroline Downey and Andy Nielsen to the speakers' chairs, and if they just, we'll just wait till they, they get there. Okay, Sue, if you'd like to introduce it. Um, thank you, Chair. This is an application for the erection of a four-bed dwelling and detached garage and the change of use of agricultural land to garden land. If I can bring uh, members' attention to the update paper, there's a typo in the first reason for refusal and the word not should be deleted. And it should read as follows in, in terms of the first sentence. It is considered that the proposed dwelling would be out of keeping with the character and appearance of the area. And then the rest of the um, reason for refusal remains the same. Um, there's nothing further to add. And the officer's recommendation is for refusal. Thank you, Sue. 
Good evening, both of you. Um, you have four minutes between you, and I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and Committee Members. My name is Andy Nielsen, and I'm the applicant. As you would have seen from the short video, the application site is in the rear garden of the recently rebuilt Roselen. Outline, outline planning permission was granted for two further dwellings at the site many years ago. This new dwelling will be set behind Roselen. Although the ribbon of development runs along the front of the, the lane, precedent has been set at the rear by way of a dwelling in the rear garden of the neighbouring property Flora. This new family home has been commissioned by a former resident of Bradley, who until recently lived in the village for 17 years. Although initially one of the reasons for the refusal, the planning officers now acknowledged the new dwelling would not be isolated. The officers believe the new dwelling would harm the amenity of the area and would be visually intrusive. We disagree as it has been sympathetically designed to complement other buildings locally, to sit within its landscape, and it is over 500 metres from the nearest public right of way to the south. The dwelling has been designed to be a truly environmentally friendly, sustainable family home using locally sourced materials and constructed by hand by local craftsmen. Using a timber frame structure allows for new high-tech insulation to be installed, which gives very low U values. It also gives extremely good air tightness. This then allows for the dwelling to be heated by an air source heat pump. In addition to this, solar panels will be installed but hidden from view in the cropped roof. These will supply electricity for the house and to an electric car charging point. Rainwater harvesting will also be installed. In having to offset the nitrates, there will be more land to create a truly unique biodiverse habitat to encourage wildlife. We will be planting trees, hedgerows and wildfire areas, amongst other enhancements to support the landscape character. As you have heard from Mr Nielsen, the application before you is recommended for, for, for refusal, solely on the grounds of being contrary to EM1 and EM10, or simply a landscape objection, and it's the Council's belief that the harm significantly and demonstrably outweighs the benefit that a dwelling would provide. In this case, there is the added disadvantage of nitrates. In order to offset for the nitrate load that a new dwelling creates, land must be taken out of agricultural production. We as consultants have tried to work alongside Natural England to find solutions. The only solution that Natural England will accept in this case and currently, due in part to this council currently, currently not accepting nitrate credits, was for the adjacent land to Roseland being turned into garden land. One of the reasons for refusal is a little ambiguous and misleading on this point, and so I wanted to give you members some more clarity on the matter. The site will not encroach into agricultural land, merely that the 0.5 half acre parcel of the edge of the agricultural field will be taken out of production. This change to garden land, but not curtilage, was approved by this council in January this year at another site you have one minute. with similar nitrate concerns. When consider considering the appropriate local plan policy, SS6A, the application before you is on previously developed land in that it is the garden land of the existing dwelling Roseland. It is not an isolated form of development it is not of high environmental value, and the proposed scale of the development is suitable for the site. However, the council is currently unable to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply, and we have recently been informed it is worsening rather than improving. Members, you've heard me mentioning this before, debating the interpretations of paragraph 11D of the MPPF, and how it's a matter of individual interpretation versus another. The harm must significantly outweigh the benefit, yet there is already a presumption in favour of development before any harm can be attributed. Simply put, the harm must significantly must be significantly greater when considered in the planning balance. We believe there is no harm, that the application adheres to the local plan policy regardless of the lack of five years housing land supply and should be improved. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> questions for the speakers? No. Um, I have none. If you could turn the microphone off and have a quick wipe down, that would be much appreciated. Councillor Raphael. Good evening, Councillor Raphael. You have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute left. 
Chairman, thank you for allowing me to address the meeting. And uh, as you will have seen from the report, I represented Bradley on my own for many years, um, but do no longer do so, sadly. Uh, and it, it was a privilege. Bradley's in, in the middle of nowhere. It's very difficult to build new houses uh, in the middle of nowhere without uh, taking a whole field out of action. And uh, little villages do need to uh, uh, grow very slightly as they see best. And this, as far as I can work out, uh, this application is not opposed by the Bradley Parish meeting. There haven't been huge numbers of objections. Um, and what we're left with is, is, is a, a modest proposal. And you've seen the plots. You've seen the, the dwellings in the back garden next to them. You, if you've watched the video, you've seen the houses going to be with, on the other side of the road, detached, um, uh, where the barn is further down that view there. Uh, and I just want to not avoid the words of Victor Meldrew, but I don't, I cannot believe it that there's been an, a, a, an objection on landscape grounds. I mean, the, the, the wording used seems to be out of kilter with, um, with what's there. Um, domesticating the remote road. Well, where you stand where the house is are by the road, you can see all the other properties. It's not as though it's, it's, they're doing something that's different. They're already there. Um, and removing the character of the country lane. I mean, talk about over-egging it, I would suggest. I mean, how does one more dwelling right there going to remove the character of the country lane? I just don't see that. Uh, and in terms of the design, and when you look at the policy EM1, you've got to look at the shape and design uh, and um, uh, how it may be, whether it is detrimental to the character and visual amenity of the landscape. Well, it's, it's entirely in keeping with the other properties there. Uh, I, I, I just would urge you to just look at things in the round and, uh, and, and consider whether just on this occasion the objections are being worded too strongly. And in reality, uh, the applicants have done their best uh, to uh, come up with a scheme that fits into the landscape admirably. Uh, one of the matters that I hope you've managed to wrestle with within the papers is the nitrate offsetting part. They wanted to put trees in, and then you didn't have to worry about um, what was in there. Uh, but apparently they're not allowed to do that. They've got to keep it open. So that's why it's been called garden. And I don't know whether there's conditions can be imposed that deal with that, that little part. But we're often talking about nitrate offsetting. Well, they've managed to achieve it on site effectively which has got to be good, rather than doing it somewhere else in the borough. Uh, and uh, wh why taking a field out of agricultural production harms the landscape? I'm not sure that that, that you have one minute. is a strong argument. Uh, so in the round, I, I would urge you to uh, approve this application uh, and reject the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much. Questions for Councillor Raphael? Okay, I've got one, if no one else has. The triangular area that's going to be used for, or is proposed to be used for nitrate offset, is that at the moment it's agricultural. What is that good agricultural land or is it poor agricultural land? Is it used for, for grazing or is it used for arable crops? From the pictures, it looks like arable crops. But can I say this, that I'm not the best person to answer that with respect, Chairman. I think the applicants will probably know the answer straight away. If you want me to ask them and then repeat the answer, I will do so. I know that I got into trouble from turning around previously <laughs> from people telling me off or them off. Councillor Gaskell. Uh, well, well, sorry, I, I better declare an interest here because I am now uh, the new councillor for this ward uh, and I can confirm it's arable crops um, and I, I completely agree with everything you've said tonight I, I, don't, I don't see this as a, a, as a as an issue I think it blends in quite well I, I really don't understand why we've declared it as, as um, a... we're we're in questions to okay. the speaker so yeah. if, keep that for later please right sorry <laughs> thank you any more questions for councillor Raphael yeah thank you councillor Raphael questions to officers we have no more speakers. No. Questions to officers? Councillor Gaskell. 
Yeah, just following up on that, um, why have we stopped the, the applicant putting trees in that land? Um, I believe that was a requirement of Natural England in terms of the nitrates. Um, that, that, that's the only reason. Albeit I know on other sites that um, Natural England encourage woodland to be planted because then you can actually see if there's been a change to the character of the land. But um, in this instance, if I draw your attention to page 153, um, there's details there in terms of Natural England, um, their comments, and also what they would consider should be covered by conditions if you were minded to um, approve it. And that covers things like um, not putting any hard standing on and no trees are on there. So that's a requirement of Natural England. Um, and if members are minded to approve it, we can condition things like that. Sorry, can I just have a supplementary that my understanding for nitrates and phosphates is it's um, it's a product of uh, fertilizers which farmers use if this bit of land is being taken out of agricultural use then those fertilizers aren't going to go into the ground and the nitrates won't be there but in putting trees there you're going to absorb more carbon and obviously that's a benefit as well so i'm just wondering whether there's some confusion here uh, and Natural England aren't looking at carbon emissions or um, that side of things. It's, I mean, like I say, I can just refer you to one, page 153, and they specifically say the residential land to be maintained as garden and no trees proposed as a result of this application to be removed. So other ones that elsewhere on the site have to be kept. No hard standing on the residential land um, and that, um, that the land has to, be sold, has to be retained in perpetuity with the dwelling and not sold off at any time as well. So those are the requirements of Natural England. That, that's all I can refer you to. So those are elements that we can control by condition if you're minded to approve it. Sorry. Yeah, and also just, just referring above, it looked, it, 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 um, you will know that the scheme was originally um, put forward to plant, plant it up as a woodland. Uh, it wasn't officers that asked for that change to be required. It appears that we would have had to have secured that via 106, so uh, the applicant decided to change the mitigation proposal um, and then you've got the subsequent comments that, that Sue's already referred to. Any more questions for officers? Councillor Court. Hey, Jack. Um, just trying to get some clarification on the word isolated here, which appears in page 145, because what we've heard is it doesn't look like it's isolated, and yet the reference would appear to say it is. So could you clarify? Yeah, if I refer you to page 146, the paragraph at the top there, where it starts, um, basically we're saying that because of its location and um, with the existing properties in the area, we're saying it's not in an isolated location. The reason for refusal is purely in terms of the landscape harm of having a dwelling to the rear of the property. If you look at the road there, all the properties face onto the road and are set some distance back. What's being proposed is a dwelling that doesn't have that orientation to the front of the site. Um, and also where it faces onto the lane at the side, it's very close to the front boundary there and doesn't have that distant setback. So it's a totally different character in terms of the form of development that's there. At the moment, you just have frontage development. This is now to changing it to an unacceptable extent. That's the, that's the view of the um, officers. Thank you, Thank you. Any more questions? No? In that case, we move to debate. Councillor Howard Sorrell. I've spoken before about my uh, my views on sustainable housing. This seems like an excellent application to me. Um, I've not heard anything beyond an assertion from the officers that this is uh, harmful to the character of the area that would make me hesitate even for a second to, to go against their recommendation for refusal um, to the point where I'm happy to make a motion now um, for approval uh, based on the fact that I the, the only reason for refusal seems to be that, that that character of the area issue or character of the landscape issue and I, I don't think that's valid so I, I'm happy to move it. Councillor Ganesh followed by Councillor Frost. I think it goes back to the how much harm uh, will outweigh the benefits. I think it's, uh, by looking at it, uh, replacing a, a green with a green, I think it's something that I can um, second uh, Councillor Howard Sorrell's uh, pr proposal. Thank you. Councillor Frost, followed by Councillor Court. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair. If we are, as a committee, are minded to um, to go against the officer uh, recommendation on here, I can support it as long as we have all the conditions from highway, uh, sorry, from uh, Natural England in there, and the fact that the use of the residential land to be retained in, perpetu in perpetuity in connection with the depth dwelling, not to be sublet or sold off. The residential land shall be maintained as garden and no trees proposed as a result of this application to be removed. No hard standing to be located on the residential land and the dwelling shall be uh, served by a, a, a PTP in perpetuity, maintenance of the PTP and no replacement of the PTP until approval granted by, by the local planning authority on application of such works. I could support your motion as long as we get those conditions put in there should you be minded to accept them. This is why you're great to have around, Councillor Frost, because you've saved me from having to say all that myself. So yeah, I, I fully agree with what you've said. Yeah. Councillor Court. Thank you, Chair. The questions have already been answered. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded for approval. Sorry. Councillor Tilbury. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, I'm sympathetic to this, but I think the danger is, is you're basically saying if someone's got a very large house with a very large garden anywhere in the countryside, then it's going to be okay to build a house in it. I mean, as Councillor Raphael said, it's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I've cycled through Bradley a lot recently. There's a, there's a phone box there, but I don't think the phone in it works anymore. There's no shop, there's no pub, there's no buses. So it's not a particularly sustainable location. So it's quite amusing to find our climate change um, proponents sort of proposing this because you know, everyone's just going to drive out there, aren't they? And they do already in very large cars, in my experience, but on very narrow roads. But that the reality is, is this is a very thin end of the wedge. If you allow this, it is, I mean, it may not be isolated in the very strict terms of the court case. And we had this with one in my ward some years ago on the edge of Oven, but they argued it was in a sustainable location because you could walk to the village. Well, you could walk to Bradley, but there wouldn't be a lot of point, is there? There's nothing there. And the next nearest place you can walk to is probably, I don't know, I mean, even Preston Candor hasn't got much in the way of shops. You know, the, the reality is, is this is very dangerous territory once you head down this road because you're basically saying you can build anywhere in the countryside on any piece of land. And most of the houses in that area, part of the countryside, have got very large areas of land. So I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I couldn't support this because I know where this will lead. Thank you. Thank you. Be moved and seconded for approval with all the conditions as outlined by Councillor Frost. Those in favour of approval. Yeah. And those against? Two. Thank you. Sue. Um, could I ask for reasons for approval and then I can give you some conditions that I would suggest. So uh, as I understand it, it would be that basically the, you don't consider that there's any harm to the landscape character of the area. Um, and, it's, and it's therefore acceptable in terms of the policy. Uh, in essence, yes. And also it's um, contributing to our land uh, housing and land supply uh, as well. As well. Um, OK. Um, one dwelling um, in terms of our housing land supply we would consider is not really sufficient um, reason but, but, but <laughs> I, I would stick to the um, just the character of the area everyone helps I know um, if I can then just go through the um, suggested conditions so we would have a condition list in the approved plans um, a time condition materials hard and soft landscaping tree protection um, hours of work hours of delivery um, details of parking for construction uh, construct, uh, construction vehicles to park, Ve um, vehicle parking for the dwelling, water efficiency, refuse, cycle provision, um, that the um, proposal um, is in adherence with the biodiversity mitigation in a, um, a report that was submitted as part of the application, also a biodiversity management plan. Um, going on from the Natural England comments, so that the area of land um, is... Um, remains in the same occupation isn't sub and isn't subdivided or separated from the existing planning unit, um, that the area of land shall be so used solely for residential garden land, um, that the no hard surfacing as per Natural England's requirement, 
maintenance of the package treatment plant and uh, foul water drainage. And then also there was another comment raised by environmental health officer in terms of radon gas and that there's a condition on there in terms of ground gases as well. Yeah, that all sounds fantastic. Thank you for such a <laughs> thorough, <laughs> thorough account of what we need to do. Um, it, do we need to vote with those, with those conditions added? I'm assuming not, but sh should we have added those conditions prior to voting? Or Sorry. So basically, do you need to vote on those conditions or just general agreement that that's what, there are no other ones that you want me to put on there? Everybody agreed on the conditions? Agreed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it would be important to actually, the, the fact that there were two people that were against the actual um, uh, the motion, that it, it's important that you know, agreement is got from everyone who voted for it and also uh, to register the, uh, uh, the objections of, of the two people uh, that voted against it. I think, Chair, that's done by the substantive vote that we've already had. So do we need to vote for it? No, we don't need to vote on conditions. Okay, thank you everybody. We have concluded on item two. Thank you very much. And Lisa, I believe you want to come back to us on something on item one. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and apologies, I, I, I should have raised it at the time you, you were taking the vote. Um, um, you will note that my recommendation included um, the requirement to enter into a legal agreement to secure necessary infrastructure. Um, so I, I I would um, suggest that you also include, a f obviously that's not been completed, so that you include a further refusal reason um, for the lack of the 106, because otherwise all of that infrastructure that we were going to get, um, you know, should it go to appeal and it then be allowed, it, it wouldn't be captured by that if you didn't put a further refusal reason on there. So apologies for not raising it at the time. Thank you. That's a standard condition, isn't it? Is everybody content with that? I'm happy with that, yeah. Chair. Agreed. Thank you. Right, item three. Right. If we could have Councillor Keith Watts and Councillor Sharon Egan to the speakers' chairs, please. Um, if you just wait, if you just wait there, turn the microphone off whilst the officer introduces the case. Thank you, Chair. So item number three, uh, which can be found on page 161 of tonight's agenda, is an outline application uh, for the relocation of the existing Whitchurch Montessori Nursery and Forest School into a purpose-designed uh, building at land at corner of Wells Lane and Parkview in Whitchurch. If I could draw members' attention to the update paper, um, which summarises the undertaking of the site viewing, uh, provides an additional response received from the applicants, as well as offers of comments, and the recommendation to remove a duplicated condition. Um, the application is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions listed at the end of the officer's report on the agenda paper. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, yeah, I assume we've got Councillor Sharon Egan sitting there. You have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair, and um, good evening, Councillors. Um, um, I come first of all with apologies, Keith Watts can't be here, um, but um, he's been very helpful in working uh, with me on the statement I'm about to make. Um, I am a councillor and here on behalf of Whitchurch Town Council, um, and we are in support of this application. Um, this is not an application for a new nursery school. Um, it is for relocation to a small new building on a brownfield site within the settlement policy boundary. The nursery school is an asset to our community and needs a dedicated space within which to work for five days a week. Currently, 37 children are enrolled in the nursery school and I expect that when COVID-19 is under control, the number will revert to more than 50. There are 242 neighbour comments on the planning website for this application. 
And the way to evaluate responses to consultation is not by counting heads. It is necessary to consider the relevance of each comment and its significance to the application. I will quote from just two examples. There is an overwhelming need for more full-time childcare in Whitchurch for working families. This is an excellent local central location, walking distance for the majority of people, reducing the need to drive. And the Montessori nursery has been an amazing setting for young children to learn both to start an academic life, but also to gain knowledge of the greater world around them through their forest school. Whilst you are considering your decision on this application, please think of their little faces if they are told that their nursery school has to close. There are comments from genuine neighbours concerned about traffic and parking. Such comments are to be expected about any application for development in Whitchurch, but I'm sure that measures such as sharing timetables to alleviate problems foreseen can be brought to this committee as reserved matters. This has now been approved by Hampshire Highways. I certainly hope that the local preschool groups will collaborate to minimise conflict. Many of the objections are similar in content. They cite, out of context, local plan policy EM1 landscape, but EM1 says the assessment of character and visual quality should be proportionate to the scale and nature of the development proposed. That does not mean that every spot of scrubland must be left as it is. On the positive side, policy EM5, green infrastructure, calls for policies which remedy deficiencies in the green infrastructure network. This planning application is an opportunity to do that now along a public right of way. This has been addressed by the Ecology Report. I you urge have one you minute. to grant, thank you, Chair. I urge you to grant outline permission. BDBC policy EM4, EM10 and EM12 have been delivered. The Town Council feel that the parking issues have been addressed and policy LD1 in the Whitchurch Neighbourhood Plan has been addressed as there will still be green corridor within the development which will be maintained. Rejection of this application would be a tragedy for Whitchurch and for the children being educated in this school who could carry the ethos of nature conservation into their adult lives in Whitchurch. Thank you for your time, councillors. Questions for the speaker? I have Councillor Tilbury. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Egan. Um, you suggested that we read there's 37 at the moment in the use of the Montessori in the, in the church rooms there, and it revert to more than 50. But I was, is that correct? Because I didn't understand. I, I, my understanding is they didn't have that many anyway there. Uh, thank you, Councillor. That might well be um, a question which can be better addressed um, by the applicant who I understand is here. Um, our understanding is and hope that there is a pressing need for um, good um, childcare facilities in the town, and that's why we would expect this to serve um, the need of the town in doing so. Thank you. Councillor Colt. Good evening. Um, I'm just looking at the, the anticipated number of, uh, of, of uh, youngsters you're going to have, which is uh, up to 50, but you've only got an allocation for uh, five car parking spaces. And what I'm trying to work out is, even on a saturated and wet day, would people walk up here rather than use their car? Uh, we have a, a beautiful town and lots of people do indeed uh, try and walk places. Um, the parking has been a, a consideration clearly of the local neighbours and the applicant has done a considerable amount of work to address those concerns. Um, this is something that the council very carefully deliberated and considered and arrived on balance of supporting the application um, in light of the, the response to those concerns which have been raised by neighbours by the applicant themselves. Many thanks. Any more questions for the applicant? Okay. No others. I have one. Um, I believe the Montessori is operating from temporary premises at the moment, very, very nearby. How far away is that? And is that causing any problems in terms of traffic and access to its existing location? 
uh, thank you. That's not something which we have um, heard. Um, it's it's very close by actually. It's it's um, a, you know a few moments um, of a walk, um, maybe a bit slower uh, with a toddler in tow, uh, but it is very near. I don't know if we might be able to see on the map actually. It's um, very very close. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's just on the bottom right of that that picture there, as you can see. That's where the the current church is. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Councillor Freeman. Thank you. Uh, can you tell me currently how many other community groups actually use that green space? Because I'm aware there's another nursery in the quite close vicinity. Do they use those woods? And after it's been fenced off for the Montessori, will they still have access to those woods? Because I'm, I'm, what my concern is that by fencing off that parcel of land, you will deny access to it for other small community groups that use it on a regular basis? Again, um, it's probably something that you best ask the um, applicant. Um, the council heard very clearly from the applicant when we were considering uh, this application, what their approach was going to be <clears throat> in terms of ensuring access, which I, I mentioned in my statement. Um, and again, um, all I can say is that the council listened very carefully, deliberated, and chose to um, not object um, to this application. Thank you. There are no more hands up. If you could um, just have a quick wipe down. And the next speaker, if we could have to this chair, is Michaela Pyle. Good evening to you. You will have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute left. And the button is on the deck in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. I represent the huge majority of Whitchurch residents who object to this application. Generations of Whitchurch families have visited this lovely woodland since the railway closed in 1964. Our children play here, under the trees, where we spot an abundance of wildlife. This site is essential to wildlife and to our well-being, to our mental and physical welfare. The old railway line was generated from a polluted industrial site to being a beautiful woodland with no human help or interference. If we're serious about tackling the climate emergency, it makes no sense to add extra pressure to existing woodland and wildlife. The whole ecosystem would be affected by clearance for a car park, a building, a high metal fence, and by the presence of up to 40 children playing out of doors every day. Our own outstandingly good Rising Fives Preschool is a community-based charity. Like all other providers in Whitchurch, we have a fully inclusive and accessible admissions policy and are experienced in a wide variety of special needs. It is totally untrue for Montessori to claim that they're unique in this. We offer the same forest school activities as Montessori, who now want to take over the whole area for their exclusive use during business hours. We want all our residents and tourist visitors to have free and open access to the whole length of this site at any time and to enjoy the views over the heart of the conservation area. We object to the deliberately misleading mapping of an access path which doesn't exist, overlooking loss of privacy and noise pollution, underestimates of the amount of vegetation that would be cut down, unenforceable promises about how many future staff and parents would walk to the nursery, and unworkable plans for parking, access and traffic control, which would put safety at risk at a junction where there was recently a dangerous car crash. Above all, we do not need three early year settings on this side of town, when the southeast half of Whitchurch has no preschool provision at all. We provided you with references to planning policies about the way this application contravenes. Local plan policies EM1, EM4, EM5 and EM10. CM7 and CM9. BDBC's Green Infrastructure Strategy. Accessibility Standards and Parking for Nurseries. Supplementary Planning Document. And our own Whitchurch Neighbourhood Plan. Whitchurch Town Council has refused to listen to residents. In its consultancy comment and in its uninformed speech tonight, it has failed to understand and discuss all the relevant issues and you have one minute. our neighbourhood plan. 
If this proposal goes ahead, it will set a dangerous precedent for speculative developers. 148 objections clearly show how much our residents value this woodland site. We must preserve it for our children now and in the future. So please help us and reject this unwanted application tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Could you turn the microphone off, please? Thank you. Questions for the speaker? No. Thank you very much. If you could have a wipe down before you go. I'm going to get tired of saying that tonight. <laughs> um, right. Um, if we could have the next speakers, which is Andy Clems, Julia Timbury, and Titania Quelsh. You have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and I welcome recommendations to approve the application by the Head of Planning. There have been several concerns raised by local residents over the level of noise the nursery would create. I would like to reassure the committee that the ethos of our forest school is all about learning, loving and appreciating nature. The children do not run around screaming and shouting. The children are encouraged to use soft voices and walking feet to explore the woodlands. The children spend time laying on the floor, watching the clouds, listening to the trees moving in the wind and observing the wildlife, making dens, building bug houses, uh, doing bark rubbings and so on. Uh, the children appreciate nature. We don't want to, them to scare it away. And there is no proposal for any outside hard play area in the forest itself as our outdoor area. The councillors that visited on Friday would have seen that there was a group of children from the local preschool doing just that, appreciating the woodland. And there was no noise generated. And as far as I'm aware, no local residents have complained about the children playing in the area. Concerns have been raised about the land and what happens if we leave it. Will a load of houses be built on it? The committee will be aware that Hampshire County Council have agreed a 10-year lease with us and I'm happy to agree a condition to be put on that if we are asked to leave, that the building be removed and the land reinstated. Concerns have been raised over loss of provisions for the local preschool that currently use the site and dog walkers. Our application does not include the whole of the woodland area and we've repeatedly stated throughout the whole process that we will open up all of our provision for all local <coughs> nurseries and their children. We want as many children as possible to learn the natural environment in a safe environment. Local nurseries and preschools can continue to use the site as they currently do, but with the reassurance that the children cannot run off and fall down the very steep hill onto the main road. Or they can come into our fenced area and enjoy the enclosed provision, adding further reassurance that the children are safe at all times. Dog walkers will continue to be able to use the woodland and walk through just on a safer route further in from the steep slope. During the councillor's visit on Friday, they would have noticed that the current informal pathway runs alongside the deep, steep, steep uh, drop onto the main road. And in a wet weather, so close to the edge, it can become quite dangerous. The new informal pathway will be a, a safer distance away from the edge, but there will still be a woodland to continue to maintain a buffer between the path and the residential homes. Uh, we hope that the concern over the parking that's been raised um, would have been addressed by submitting the car parking management plan which sets out the access to the parking provision and the proposal is use is satisfied, uh, satisfactory and workable and it has been confirmed by Hampshire County Council Highways. Uh, county states that the plan adequately manages visitors and would not result in on-street car parking. Our nursery is currently just across the road from where we are at the moment. We've got no allocated parking spaces there at all um, and we've not received a single complaint from any local resident and nor has the church. You have one minute. Finally, concerns have been raised over the loss of open space. The woodland continues to be referred to as open space, and yet it's in the advice that I've been given and understood this is not designated open space in either the Basingstoke and Dean Borough Council Green Infrastructure or the Neighbourhood Plan. It is referred to as a green corridor, which will be retained and enhanced. The application does not result in the loss of the green corridor at all. In fact, our woodland management will see it grow stronger and healthier over the years to come. I thank you for your time, and I hope that you vote favourably for this approval. Hi everyone, um, I'm a Witcher resident of nine years and I'm a mum. When I needed a full-time childcare to allow me to return to work full-time after maternity leave, I had to reserve a place with Oak Tree Nursery for my baby before even he was born. 
As a working mum looking for the childcare, the other local providers either close at 3.30 or require Monday and Friday booking, which is not the flexible provision needed by modern working parents. This is offered by Montessori Nursery. I see where church continues to expand with the new um, estates being built. I'm going to have to ask you to wind up your over the four minutes. Uh, with young families moving into the town, so I would like you to all support this application to sustain continued growth of the church. Thank you. If you turn your microphone off, please. Questions to the speakers? No, I have none, so thank you very much. And say, so somebody could do a quick wipe down. <laughs> and if we could have Councillor Follett Maitland as the next speaker, please. Good evening, Councillor. You have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. I speak here this evening both as Borough Councillor in support of this application and for sake of transparency, as I've disclosed previously, as a parent with two children at the Montessori, though both will be out of the system by the time this application would go forward. I come here today to address issues raised by opponents and to try and find a constructive and equitable way forward. I'm acutely aware that the online discussion of this application on Facebook has become particularly nasty, unpleasant and personal. Mm -hmm. To be clear, I'll have no part in that. Firstly, I would like to draw out an understanding of the wider context in which this application is being proposed, why there is a clear market need and how this site is realistic and viable. It goes without saying it's a sensitive application. It comes with a negative baggage of an earlier unsuccessful application on the Nolings field, a much used and well-loved Whitchurch green space, and well before my election as borough councillor. To clarify, I would not have supported that site choice. This application also comes at a time when residents are rightly getting worried about the local plan update, which will bring at least 310 houses to Whitchurch. It would not be incorrect to say that the local plan update is going to come down to trying to find the least bad sites for development in Whitchurch. As a borough councillor who is thoroughly depressed by the prospect of so much development being forced onto Whitchurch, this saddens me, but also forces the need for more infrastructure ever more clearly into view. We absolutely cannot go on building more houses with no reference to the infrastructure that is needed. These are the hard choices we face. We have three uh, nurseries in Whitchurch, Oak Tree, Whitchurch Montessori, and Rising Fives. Whitchurch Montessori offers flexible part-time childcare in a way that neither Oak Tree or Rising Fives offers. Rising Fives offers term time childcare only, and Oak Tree offers a full five days a week or at least a Monday and Friday. Business competition and the relative proximity of one nursery to another is not a material planning consideration. I would also like to address the issue of this site's appropriateness. On the basis that it preserves and does not sever the green corridor and public access along the former embankment as required under policy EM5, and Whitchurch Neighbourhood Plan, paragraph 7.32 and 7.33, and that improvements to its biodiversity will be made, I am satisfied that, on balance, it is an appropriate and certainly less bad than the previous site at the Nolings. You have one minute. The site is clarified as brownfield and is currently designated in the local plan as open space or green and is not currently designated in the local plan as open space or a green corridor. However, it is designated in the Whitchurch neighbourhood plan as part of a green corridor which runs along the disused railway embankment. On balance, it is as appropriate as is likely to be achieved now. I understand and I'm sympathetic to the concerns of local residents that the proposed sites could slide into housing. 
as I made clear in my written submission, I would like to see safeguards in place to ensure the site would only be used for the proposed educational purposes. I'm aware that the applicant has sought to attach this condition. Finally, I'm also encouraged to see the applicant has offered to open up the forest school services. Again, this is something I recommended in my written representation. I can only reiterate that there is room for all to coexist. We need infrastructure that reflects the needs of working families. I'd ask you to wind up, please. Okay. I'm happy to explain further why other sites are not viable within any questions afterwards. Thank you. Questions for the councillor? No, no hands up. Thank you very much. If you could have a wipe down. And next speaker is Councillor Fillimore. Evening, Councillor Fillimore. You have four minutes, and I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. Good evening, Chair, members and officers. I'm here on behalf of the huge majority of Wichita's residents who have objected to this plan application. Montessori Nursery wants to relocate to a woodland site along part of an old railway embankment. The proposal would fence off the site and prevent public access without any suitable replacement provision, contrary to NPPF, Paragraph 97A, Local Plan EM5, Green Infrastructure Strategy Accessibility Standards. It would also affect, adversely affect the work of the Rising Fives Preschool, the only local provider with an outstanding offset rating, who use the woodland for their environmental studies in the same way that Montessori hopes to do. This contributes which its neighbourhood plan 7.24, development should not compromise the integrity or existing assets or facilities and also local plan CN8, loss of community facilities. Wichurch neighbourhood plan refers to the site as one of the key biodiversity assets of Wichurch, and particularly a valued continuous green corridor of the disused railway line. There are, there are inexplicable and deliberately misleading errors in the site plans, which show a path along the embankment on the side adjacent to housing in Park View. Offered as an alternative access, to the rest of the woodland beyond the bridge over Church Street. This path does not exist. Historic Google images and evidence from local residents along with the existence of undergrowth and trees along the line of the edge show that this is a fabrication. If the application did go ahead and the path was created, there would be unacceptable direct overlooking in the residents' gardens and bedroom windows from the height of the steep embankment contravening EM10. Exit from the site is on a narrow road the only access to a busy estate and close to a dangerous road junction with Wales Lane, where speed limits are frequently both broken. You have seen photographs of a recent traffic crash with two vehicles being written off right opposite the proposed entrance. The car park is too small to meet, be, to meet the own, our own council's own parking SPD for nurseries and the complicated and unworkable car parking plan submitted is based on unenforceable promises about future staffing, numbers of staff and parents walking to work. The site is also completely unsuitable because it would concentrate three providers of nursery education into the northwestern half of Wichurch, with Montessori right next to the Rising Fives and in competition with the same resources. The whole of the southeastern half of the town, which has had all the development, has no nursery provision at all. This is too far for parents with small children to walk to a nursery. If Wichita's does have to accept yet more housing, it is very likely to be in the southeast and as a continuation of the new Mill Springs estate. Many residents believe that there could be possibly a very suitable site in this area, which would be much better in terms of planning for future needs. Please listen to Wichita's residents. They all value Montessori and hope a suitable site can, find, can be found that they need you to reject this particular site. You have Incident one minute. Incidentally, I've just heard from Rise in the Fives, they've had no contact from Montessori about using that area. Thank you. Questions for the councillor? No. Thank you very much, Councillor Fillimore. If you can have a wipe down before you. <laughs> Questions to officers? 
Councillor Tilbury. Yeah, could we add some clarity on the plan? It was suggested that they won't be fencing off the old the old area. What, what area is actually going to be fenced off? Is it the red line area that's shown on the plans? That was sort of sort of my understanding. I mean, they show it's a sort of nursery separate, but then the area right down to the bridge, you know, where, where it goes to that fallow narrow piece for those that did the tenant side doing. And also, you can see the path shown to the left there. That path doesn't exist. And as you can see from the contour line, so there's a very good reason it doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, it's a rail, very steep railway embankment there. So, yeah, which bit is going to, is the red line basically the same as the fence line? Or is the fence line much closer to the actual building? Thank you, Councillor. So on the block plan in front of you there, the, the green line denotes the fencing. It's going to be situated so in effect it, it follows the red line uh, albeit it's, it's slightly set back from the red line uh, i think as we were on the site visit it's about a meter um, from where we were standing on the public right-of-way footpath um, in terms of the other plan with the um, i suppose what's an indicative desire line um, the agent in their submission has shown that that was the old uh, right-of-way is potentially in that location and that is indicative of where a desire line could form um, not saying that they are going to form it, just that um, that's a route that could be taken um, by members of the public using the site. Any more questions for officers? No, thank you. Goodbye. Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Freeman. Uh, would it be possible to attach uh, a condition to the planning to state that the, the area must be, um, ex the, the use of the area must still be allowed to other preschools in the area, or is that not something we can do? Thank you, Councillor. I, I don't think that would be something we could uh, enforce on, on this site, or with a condition wouldn't meet the test, in, our, in, in my opinion. But thank you. Councillor Frost. Thank you, Chair. I would like to have the condition um, uh, attached after number 11 uh, that uh, at the end of the Hampshire County Council lease, if, if the lease is not to be renewed, that the building to be removed and the land returned or, or made good. Are we able to attach that? Uh, uh, thanks for your question, Councillor Frost, and I know that it was offered by the applicant. Um, I, I don't think it would actually be reasonable and, and, and just, just in terms of practical, you've got a, a perfectly decent building there with a, um, a nursery use which anybody any, anybody else might, might, might take up that lease or it, they could put, apply for a different use for the building. And also bearing in mind our, our climate and sustainability um, um, principles that we want to achieve, it doesn't really make sense to knock down a perfectly decent building. If the um, site was to become in any way untidy because the building um, was left vacant, then there are other planning powers that we could use to enforce the tidying up of the site by the serving of a Section 215 notice. So um, there are other, other, other ways of, of, of achieving that goal. Councillor Howard Sorrell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, forgive my ignorance. I, I don't have children, so possibly I don't know how nurseries work. Uh, I've noticed that Condition 20 says that there shall be no more than 40 children on site at any time. We've heard from speakers this evening that there would be up to 50. Mm. I'm assuming that's not 50 all at once, so we're not uh, inadvertently uh, removing their ability to operate the, the school. Thank you, Councillor. So, yeah, my understanding is that the number of attendants is no more than 40, but they could have more on the book. So it depends on how the business would operate and allow children on to the site. So there could be more uh, on, on the books, if you like. But, yeah, the condition is no more than 40 on the site. Mm. Any more questions for the officers? No? In that case, debate. Councillor Freeman. Um, it concerns me the loss of, of use of that land from the other preschool that's in the area, plus the, the residents. They're, they're talking about fencing off quite an area that's used on a regular basis by other groups, by dog walkers, by other children playing. And they're talking about fencing off that whole area and denying the access to most of Whitchurch, and I don't know, it doesn't sit well with me. I understand your concern. Whether that is a planning reason, because this is not public access land, it is actually private land. So I'm going to ask Lisa or Sue to 
comment on that? Uh, yes, you're quite right. It's it's a private space, albeit it's obviously used by 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 um, a number of other um, locals, um, local residents. A lot of local residents use it. Um, I don't think that would be a material planning reason to refuse it. You've obviously got the applica application before you, um, and there um, the officer's reports put forward a number of other benefits as to why the proposal is acceptable. Um, so, you know, you'd have to decide whether the I think the actual use by other groups is, isn't something that you could reasonably put forward as a, as, as a refusal reason. Thank you. Councillor Frost. Thank you, Chair. I, I too have a concern about uh, uh, the substantial fencing off of, of, of the area. However, um, taking the, uh, um, the last comments of the planning officers into consideration, I think on balance, I am minded to approve this and therefore submit a motion to approve right here, right now, for, uh, for avoidance of doubt. And the reasons for approval are laid out on page 161 by the paragraphs 1, 2 and 3. Councillor Ganesh. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm in mind of uh, second in the motion tabled uh, for agreeing with Thank you. Councillor Tilbury. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the application because the Montessori exists. It was sort of kicked out of Hampshire County Council School, which I think is why Hampshire have been trying to help with this. But I don't think you sort of help the situation by basically taking away land from another. I mean, the other one is a charity as well. This uh, The Montessori is a limited company. It's a private business, which Hampshire are obviously keen to lease the land to. And you can, oh, we don't know why Hampshire want to do that because they haven't got any money. But... That, but to effectively prevent the others from using it, say, well, they could use it or whatever, but it's uh, if this was just for the building there and it was fenced off to the end of that and they use the land like other people, I wouldn't really have a problem with it. I could see that there's, you know, there are issues with it, but it's the fencing off of the entire area. And what I said, it's, well, it isn't sort of, it is private. It's owned by the county council, which belongs to us effectively, isn't it? It's, it's been used as public land to all intents and purposes. They could probably have claimed it as a, a public common if they'd have tried, if there'd been an issue. But it's, I think that's what's causing the problem. And if there was some way you could deal, could deal with that, yeah, um, but at the moment, I mean, I couldn't support an application that takes land away from a charity, basically. It just sticks, it's just wrong. Yeah, I just, just wanted to say to members, obviously, clearly that the landowner could, in, in effect, fence the site off in, in its entirety um, at any time without requiring planning permission in any event. So um, just just something to, be, to, to, put, to bear in mind. Councillor Goderson, and then we'll go to the vote. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, if, my mem if my memory serves me correct, the applicant did indicate that they would not be objecting to other groups of children and people using it. I mean, surely we can put a condition in say, saying that that must be the case. I, well, I don't understand why we. Could, why I don't understand why we can't put such a condition in. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded for approval. Those in favour. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. And those against? Three. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the application has been approved, subject to the conditions listed at the end of the officer report. Thank you. Thank you. Item four, and if we could have Jill Hill to the speaker's chair, please.
Okay, item four, Lanier Tile Barn, Heriot, Hampshire. And if um, Sue, you could introduce it, please. Thank you, Chair. This is an application for permission permission in principle for the creation of one dwelling near Tarbarn in Herriard. If I could just bring, draw your attention to the update paper, the applicant has provided two further history maps within the um, showing the history of Herriard and that there was a dwelling on the site. Um, the officer's report has addressed this on page 198, acknowledges it and it's noted. However, a dwelling has not been cited at the application site for in excess of 100 years. Um, there is also a correction in terms of the seal paragraph. A single dwelling is still liable, um, but would attract a nil charge in line with the council's charging um, schedule. Um, but it should be noted that um, matters regarding seal are not dealt with until the TDC stage, the technical design consent stage. So subject to that clarification, the officer's recommendation is for refusal. Thank you. So... Ms Hill, you have four minutes, and I'll warn you when you have one minute left, and the button is on the deck in front of you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Uh, I speak as the Chair of Herriot Parish Council, which is in unanimous support for this permission in principle application by Mr and Mrs Freer. It's my opinion this application would fit in with existing nearby houses. There have been two self-build houses built this year close to the proposed site, by existing Herriot residents. One, a timber-clad infill house on land previously belonging to the owners of Tal Barn, and next door to that, a two-storey brick house built on agricultural land off Back Lane, now known as King John's Lane. So these recent approvals would indicate the site is not isolated, but in an appropriate location, and a new dwelling here would form part of an existing settlement in Herriot known as Nash's Green. There is local need for housing. This is evidenced by a village survey carried out by the Parish Council in 2015 to ascertain Herriot's housing needs. Results from that survey sent to 106 households showed people thought current housing stock was not sufficiently large or diverse. 12 existing parish tenants would like to buy their own house in the village. 10 of these reported that price was the main barrier. 71% thought the village needed more housing. Five households reported knowing people forced to leave the parish due to lack of available housing. There are no brownfield sites in Herriot, so any housing development uh, needs to be on undeveloped and or unproductive agricultural land. The proposed site is demarcated with old hedges on three sides. The hedges mark the original plot on which a dwelling once existed, as evidenced from old maps. And from my own site visit, I can confirm the remains of building materials, such as pieces of brick, lying on the surface where the previous dwelling existed, meaning this plot is on previously developed land. Secondly, Katie and, and David Freer have strong roots in Harriet. Katie's parents were well-known figures of the community. Her mother taught in the local school and ran an aerobics class for over 50s. Her father, Mike Brannigan, was on the parish council and became chair in, in 2015 until he died. The Freer family are advocates of making lifestyle changes to combat climate change. In 2018, Katie established a successful eco-shopping company to mitigate single-use plastic for a range of cleaning products. And in the first weeks of COVID, lockdown, her business supplied over 30 vulnerable residents with free bottles of hand sanitizer. David Freer has his own international business which brings work to local businesses. He was parish clerk for four years and helped to digitise the parish council's processes. He also set up a volunteer group, Herriot Helpers, during lockdown to help elderly and vulnerable people. You have one minute. He helps out at a local food bank and is a member of the church council. The Freer family are not outsiders wishing to live a country life in Herriot, but a well-known family with strong historic connections to the village. They are community-minded and actively support eco-friendly and sustainable initiatives. They would be a considerable loss to this community if they had to move away. In conclusion, the application, if successful, would add to Herriot's stock of mixed owner-occupied houses, and the proposal would make a small contribution to the borough's supply of houses. In addition, it will provide a new home for a local family who want to stay in Herriot. 
for many years to come. I would urge councillors to support the application for planning and principle. Thank you. Thank you. If you could turn your microphone off. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? I have none, so thank you very much. And if you could have a quick wipe down before you, you go. Um, so David Freer, the next speaker. You have four minutes and I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. Hi, um, my name is David Freer, I'm the applicant. Um, I've got four areas I'd like to talk to you about today. First of all, our plan. So working with a local landowner and planning consultant, this, this was felt to be the most suitable available plot in the village as it used to have a dwelling on it. In response to the current climate emergency, we want to build an eco house with a low profile with a finish that reflects buildings in the local area. We're asking for your approval tonight so we can advance to a technical phase of the application process. Two, why we want to build. We have roots in this village and feel like part of the fabric of the local community. My wife's family, four generations now, have lived in the same house for over 40 years. We were married in the local church and our children were all christened there. We see this as a chance to grow the village in an incremental fashion by a family who are passionate and contributing members of the community. We moved down 10 years ago to live with and help care for my wife's family. They passed away earlier this year and we've sold the family home to pay inheritance tax and settle the estate. We have a short term rental arranged until we find out your decision this evening. Local family houses in the area sell for over a million pounds and we just can't afford them. Three, the status of the current application. On the portal, our initial application started in April 2021, received unanimous support from neighbours, local farmers, Harriet Estates, local businesses, Harriet Parish Council and our ward councillor. The application was also formally approved by all the consulted bodies, including Highways England, B&D Biodiversity Team, B&D Landscape Team and Natural England. Following discussion with the planning officer in September, we supplied a history of Harrier documents showing four historic maps that show the plot had a dwelling, sometimes number of dwellings on it throughout the 18th and 19th century. I hope you've all had a chance to review that. Four, and lastly, our response to the planning officer's concerns. The planning officer has raised concerns about the impact on the landscape, which surprised us after reading Basic Silk and Dean's landscape team's approval, which stated, and I'll quote here, Harriet is characteristic of a winding network of narrow lanes where sporadic individual farmsteads and groups of cottages were interspersed with views of the wider landscape beyond roadside hedgerows and trees. Visibility of the site is restricted by the existing hedging and mature trees to the north and east. To the south is open fields where views to the proposed dwelling are limited and could be mitigated with landscaping. That's the end of the quote. My understanding is that Harriet has no settlement boundary line Looking at a bird's eye view of the village, um, the location is actually very central, a couple of hundred yards away from the village green um, and the pub and the British Legion, with many other houses stretched out in all directions beyond it. Through discussions with local farmers, we've been told that the quality of this plot's agricultural land is poor, partly due to the brick footings of the previous dwellings, which you can clearly see in the soil today. You have one minute. Thank you. A dwelling was granted approval in the field adjacent to Tile Barn next to the plot um, last year. This was also a subdivision of the agricultural land and undeveloped countryside. We plan to develop a considered landscape strategy for the next phase and have every intention to maintain the character of the local landscape. This application is for our family. It's not a commercial or a speculative application. Thank you for your time and consideration this evening. Questions for the speaker? Now, I have one. Can you give us any idea when an actual building was last sort of visibly stood on that site? Obviously, there's some remains of possibly some footings. When would anybody have last seen a building on that site? Um, the only evidence I've been able to get is from the local estates. They have a Tice map, but that was from the 19th century. There was another map they supplied, and I went to Winchester Archives and found two, two other maps. They're the only maps I've, I've been able to find that have got dwellings. I've not seen more recent ones. 
I don't know exactly. I know the officer said they couldn't find evidence until um, the start of the 20th century. Thank you. Councillor Ganesh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question's around uh, the trees. Uh, I know it's uh, not the final uh, planning, but uh, what sort of consideration you would give in terms of the number of trees may have some sort of an impact by felling or... Um, it's, it, these, these, these pictures are tricky to really get and some of them are views away from the house and away from the settlement so it, it, it's difficult for me to kind of refer to anything in the photographs because there used to be a dwelling there you can actually see a natural entrance to the site um, from the lane and there's one tree there but, as for, um, but, but we feel that wouldn't, you wouldn't need to fell any trees because you could, make it, you could build the actual dwelling at the other side of the plot and, and you've got the kind of natural entrance I don't think there's any trees that would need to be felled, especially as, as it's been used as an open field more recently. Thank you. I see no more hands up, so thank you very much. And you're already doing the wipe down, thank you. Councillor Raphael. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to address the meeting. If we can just pause on the location plan for a moment, because it's very helpful. So, first of all, on the left-hand side, the three houses that are pictured there are part of the Herod Village uh, Centre. That was a scheme that came forward hmm, 15, 20 years ago. Some of these more experienced officers will remember it. It was an open field. Uh, it wasn't felt those new houses which supported the village centre, um, which has got, now got uh, pitches on and everything else. It wasn't felt that they harmed the landscape. Um, then you've got the lane between the two, which if you follow it down, to, yes, that's the one. Just along there, at least one dw new dwelling's been built down there this year, if not two, in fact. I think it's two. Two, it is two. Um, uh, and they weren't felt to harm the landscape. So we go down the lane that we're talking about, um, uh, and on the right hand side it goes around a little bend and then you turn up in a farm it was a very old farmhouse and and whatnot so there's nothing going past but there is another dwelling there but it's just not on your um picture um and it is um winding it's sheltered it's quiet it's not in open high countryside it's, it's secluded um and th that's no doubt why the landscape officer didn't think there was a reason for a refusal. So it does beg the question why we are here. Um, and I would urge you to take the view that this is uh, a well-supported application uh, where uh, there's genuine need, not just in the personal circumstances, but in the circumstances of the parish for accommodation uh, it's been well thought through. The landowner of that field is the same landowner who has um, allowed other sites to be developed, including the Herod Village Centre to the left that I've explained, and, and believes in um, sites coming forward sensitively uh, with the support of the local community for local people. Uh, I can't think of any boxes that aren't ticked so please approve this application thank you questions for the councillor no thank you very much questions to officers no yeah councillor Konechka thank you chair um in relation to pot the potential loss of trees on the site, um, on page 206 of the report, it, it talks about concerns about the um, potential loss of trees or hedgerow. I know the applicant has said that it, he doesn't envisage any trees being um, removed as part of the project, but inevitably um, things do change and, and, and sometimes unavoidably trees or, or hedgerows or, or other items do have to be removed. If we were minded to approve this, would it be possible to attach a condition about um, any trees lost, any hedgerows lost would need to be replaced like for like. 
Um, the, the way a PIP works, we don't really put conditions on, they're really informative. So yes, you can, you can um, control, you can put something on there. So in terms of hard and soft landscaping details to be submitted, um, all you're looking at is the principle of whether that site is suitable for a dwelling. Um, in terms of the actual details, where that dwelling will be on that site, uh, where the access will go in, all of those will be dealt with at the technical, de um, technical detail consent stage. Um, so we put informatives on, um, and um, at that point we can then consider the impact on trees um, and whether the access has avoided them, whether there's a concern about um, if there's a hard surfacing going past it, we can put conditions on in terms of how um, that it's hand dug, for example, so it doesn't impact on the tree roots. But all of that is really at the technical design consent stage. Um, but yes, we put informatives on now, which um, say what we would expect to come in as part of the TDC stage. Any more questions for officers? No. In that case, debate. Councillor Goderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to, I am, of course, uh, this, this application is in my ward, but I'd like to make it quite clear that it's in that part of my ward which is covered by Councillor Raphael. I tend to concentrate on, on Basing and Litchfield itself. Um, so I've, I have never met the applicant, and for that reason I do not consider myself to be in any way predisposed. On, on this particular case, but I would I would like to point out Harriet Parish Council supports small scale development of well designed and suitably sited homes in the village, and this application will satisfy those aims well. Uh, we've got eight letters of support, no objections. Policy SS six states that new housing outside settlement policy boundaries will only be, be permitted where they are small-scale residential proposals of a scale and type that meet a locally agreed need. I think we've established that there is a locally agreed need. Uh, and then it goes on in the, uh, that it must, it must not result in an isolated form of development. If we look at Braintree DC on page 201, the Court of Appeal upheld a High Court decision which concluded that the word isolated should be given its ordinary meaning as being far away from other places, buildings, or, and people. So on that basis, I think it's reasonable to say that this is not, in a, not an iso isolated position. I mean, all in all, I, th I, th I think on balance, I would, I would, would like to propose that we um, al allow this development, as it, in, in, in every respect, it seems a, a very reasonable application to me. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Goderson, Councillor Tilbury. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very, rather like the other one, it's, it's, it's a very difficult one. I think in this case, you could possibly argue that it does meet, as Sven has said, the um, sort of a locally agreed need. I mean, you could argue that if they actually had a neighbourhood plan for Henry, which they probably wouldn't bother with because it's on the small side, they would probably have put forward a site like this anyway. And I think this is the problem. There are areas where local people will say, well, actually, we wouldn't mind housing there. And in this case, potentially, uh, there was at one point there were houses on there. Obviously, not a lot of you can remember it, but that's, that's another issue. But And I think this is always the dilemma we have with things you know we do there are places in the country so it is acceptable it's not that you're saying all those and it's got to go to over and Richard Basingstoke to well, Tadley they can't even build them anyway but it, you know there are areas where people say yeah actually this wouldn't be a bad spot to build a house there and unfortunately there are planning policies sort of are not very helpful in that thing because we tried to set a policy and we spent a lot of time doing it and Councillor Fell did a very good job of the last local plan, but you always get these odd bits that fall between the gaps. So we think, well, actually, we didn't really mean this bit or that bit there. And I think in this case, you could possibly argue that if the local people are happy with their house there, then what's the problem? I mean, it comes about the same issue. It's not the great, particularly sustainable location, that, but then <laughs> that's going to be the case if you build in the countryside. Otherwise, you just build everywhere in the town. And we've already thrown out the flat, so, you know, <laughs> we've got to build somewhere. 
Councillor Tilbury, were you seconding the motion? Yes, I'm happy to second it. I think in this case, I think we could possibly argue it's a brainfield land, although, I mean, I expect others would argue that, but in this case, as we have the authority to do it, then who's going to argue with us? Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Um, um, clearly, if um, when members um, vote on that, um, uh, I, I'd just like to remind them that um, the uh, test of policy SS6E um, regarding locally agreed need, um, obviously, the information has not been submitted um, uh, to satisfy that from an officer's point of view. Um, our guidance note um, requires a level of um, evidence to be provided, and we've not had that um, formally uh, put before us. Clearly, um, the um, applicant is a local person, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have met the requirements of that. So if members um, were, were minded um, to uh, approve the application, I would suggest that you don't say it meets that um, criteria because, um, you, you know, um, we've been um, probably through this a number of times um, where evidence is required um, to support that and we haven't had that evidence. Thank you. Anyone else for debate on this one? No. So, um, Councillor Gauteson has proposed it. Um, your reason for approval, I am sort of assuming that the basis of the landscape, there's no landscape harm because the landscape officer hasn't objected to it. Is that the basis of your reason? No, no, the basis would be that it's not harmful to the character or visual amenity of the landscape in this location. Thank you. Been moved and seconded for approval. Those in favour? Yeah, that's all of them. So, yeah, we'll minus you up. So, thank you, Chair. Um, on the basis of the um, approval, if I can just run through the suggested informatives that we would be wishing to put on, um, that the PIP um, will take effect in three years from the date of the decision notice, um, that there's a reference to SIL, um, and then in terms of the base, we also recommend um, pre. Um, application discussions with us at the, for the TDC information. Um, the TDC information should include things like a design and access statement um, and it outlines what that should address. Um, we list down ecological requirements, tree requirements, um, water efficiency, um, access points, parking details, electrical vehicle charging points. Um, the um, there's various ones um, that county have requested in terms of details of trip generation, um, accessibility, cycle parking, refuse collection, and also details of new planting, landscaping, and boundary treatment as well. I don't know if I'd mentioned that one. Uh, if I hadn't mentioned it, biodiversity in terms of uh, yeah, ecological assessment and also the biodiversity metric calculation needs to be submitted. So subject to those details and also the informative about we've declared a climate emergency, um, we would be putting those on the PIP approval. Everybody happy with that? Good, great. Councillor Frost, are you going to rejoin us? Right. Item six, land at former ITT defence site. Five? Yeah, I'm going to go home. <laughs> Sorry, item five. New Barn Farm, the old dairy Haraway, Hurstbourne Priors. So um, if we could have uh, Steve and Claire Bolam to the speaker's chairs and if you just wait there or Sue introduces it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This is a retros retrospective application for the erection of a single storey outbuilding for the use of an office stroke storage. Um, there's nothing more on the update. The recommendation is for approval subject to the conditions outlined in the committee report. Thank you. Um, I assume I'm taking a guess that it's Mr and Mrs Bolam. I was Fiance. Well, to, to, to be yet. Mr. And Mrs. Bowen. You have four minutes between you, and uh, we'll warn you when you have one minute left. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, firstly, I'd like to apologise for the retrospective nature of the application. Uh, I was convinced by the company and their marketing material 
and from some lengthy online research I did myself about similar buildings that I wouldn't need planning. And I had assumed without checking that the restrictions at New Barn Farm apply to the main dwelling and not all developments, including garden buildings. I should have checked, not been so naive, and I apologise for not doing so. Uh, we received four objections, raising a number of comments, many of which were factually inaccurate, speculative and misleading. But we've taken the time to respond to every single point, provided photographic evidence to back up our responses where applicable. Case officers have done a great job of summarising the issues and the relevant responses in their report but we welcome the opportunity to expand on a few as follows. Firstly, the scale of the building. The main dwelling is a four bedroom property of approximately 200 meters squared. The garden is approximately 15 meters by 20 meters, i.e. 300 meters squared. The outbuilding is 5.9 by four, i.e. 23.6 meters squared. So the outbuilding takes up 7.9% of the surface area of the garden. Materials. The garden building is constructed using the highest quality Siberian spruce, sourced from sustainable forests in countries with cold climates, so the wood is closer grained and heavier. The garden building is constructed from double tongue and groove 45 millimeter timber walls with interlocking corner joints. This design has been found to be superior to traditional panel techniques and allows for a stronger join when compared to screwed joints. The company used prides itself on the fact that all the cabins they've constructed in over 50 years experience in this field are still standing. A 10-year guarantee is provided on the roof covering. In short, the building is far from an off-the-shelf, cheap and cheerful build and is designed to last. Thirdly, design. In our view, the design is sympathetic to the old dairy, which has a more contemporary look than some of the other buildings on site because of the design of the single-storey side extension, the adjoining boundary wall and the angular nature of the front of the house. We wanted a black stain to match the rear of the old dairy, but the manufacturer only had charcoal and we've paused all further work on the building other than weatherproofing with their supplied stains whilst the application is considered. We will stain it black once approval is given. Fourthly, overlooking a noise light pollution. From the nearest corner of the cabin to the old piggery next door to us is approximately 17 metres, not a few metres, as stated in the objection. We've paused all further work, but subject to approval, blinds will be fitted to all windows and doors. We provided photos taken when standing up inside the outbuilding right up by the windows which clearly demonstrate that only the very top of the back door of our next door neighbours is visible, their lounge window is not visible at all. And fifthly, the previous planning application, this had nothing to do with us, a fact which could easily be checked on the website rather than making an insulting assumption that we were applying retrospectively having been previously declined. I bought the house in 2011. The previous application was made in 2009 by another resident of Newbound Farm and is a totally different proposition to the Home Office shed you can see on the pictures there. So we hope on the basis of our comprehensive responses, the case officer's recommendation to approve and the fact the historic environment team have also considered this and raised no objection that you can approve the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Questions for the speakers? Nope. Thank you very much. If you return to the public seats. Questions to officers? No. Oh, Councillor Tilbury. Oh, yeah, I'm assuming correct. Correct in assuming this only come to committee because of the number of objections because it's in the country. So it's three. There's only three. Yeah, that's it. You've answered your own question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions for the officers? Debate? And that. Councillor Leakes. I was just going to move the recommendation, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Leakes. And I take it, Councillor, you are seconding it. Thank Correct. you very much. Moved and seconded for approval. Those in favour? Yeah, it's all done. Thank you very much. Sue. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm that the application is approved subject to the conditions outlined in the committee report. Thank you very much. Right, we will do item six now. Um, <laughs> land at former ITT defence site, Jay's Close, Basingstoke. And if we could have Jamie Hanna to the speaker's chair. And if you just wait there, um, whilst Sue introduces it. 
Thank you, Chair. This is an application for the erection of external lighting um, to the um, buildings that are currently going up on site, which are Class B1, B2, B8, and there's two units serving food and drink currently on site, which is being constructed. And there's no update, and the officer's recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Mr Hannah, you have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. The button is in front of you on the, on the mic deck. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Speaking on behalf of the applicant Reedy Construction, as well as St Maldon Developments, who are the developer of the site, I'm speaking in support of the application for external lighting, which your officers have recommended for approval. As outlined in your officer's very comprehensive report, this external lighting application follows the approval of a planning application for the development of three employment units which are currently under construction. The site is surrounded predominantly by employment and industrial units with the nearest neighbouring residential properties 125 metres from the site. The proposals for the external lighting are supported by officers and it would help facilitate an existing employment development in Basingstoke and the committee report sets out how the proposed development accords with adopted local planning policy. The proposed lighting includes a mix of lighting columns and fixtures to the existing commercial buildings. The column lighting comprises six and eight metre tall columns and the wall mounted lights would be placed at three metres and eight metres from the ground. It is noted that the proposed lighting is this at the same height or lower than standard street lighting. The lights would also be pointed downwards in line with the conditions suggested by your environmental health team. As mentioned earlier, the ne nearest neighbouring properties are 125 metres to the north on Logan Road and northeast of the site at Beverly Close. The development by virtue of, um, by virtue of nature and distance from neighbours would not result in any overshadowing, loss of light, loss of privacy, or being overbearing on the occupants. This is supported by comments from statutory consultees. The council's environmental health team have confirmed that they have no issues with the proposed lighting and are satisfied that there would not be a significant impact on neighboring amenity. In addition, addition the lighting spill plan submitted with the application shows that the lighting spill would not go past the site's boundaries. The highways consultee has also confirmed that the proposed lighting would not have an impact on highway safety and the council's ecologist has confirmed that there would not be an unacceptable impact on protected species. Concern has been raised by nearby residents that the site could become a meeting point at night and give rise to safety issues. As noted by the officer in the committee report, the proposed lighting scheme will improve the safety of the area and provide greater visibility along Jay's close at night. The site is also secured by fencing and controlled gates, which would reduce the possibility of the site be becoming a meeting point. The redevelopment of the site is also allowed for the reuse of a vacant commercial building, which would have had a higher public safety risk than an unoccupied building. Concerns have also been raised in respect of additional noise and traffic. The impact of noise and highways on neighbouring properties were considered as part of the scheme for three commercial units for the site, which were found to be acceptable by statutory consultees. You have one minute. Cool. The lighting scheme, which is the subject of this committee, um, would also have no impact on this. Neighbor, neighbors also commented that the development would attract rats and other desir undesirable wildlife to the area. As stated previously, the proposed lighting scheme is part of a wider development on the site approved in early 2020. The scheme replaced previous vacant buildings on the site, which would have attracted this sort of an issue in an unmaintained site. The wider development that this application supports has provided the opportunity to, to regenerate this site and allow for proper management to avoid these sorts of issues. The principle of development is considered acceptable by officers and statutory consultees and accords with relevant national and local planning policy. The applicant is an experienced developer and this application would facilitate a high quality development which has already regenerated the site. The proposed scheme will support the ongoing development of the site and therefore, in view, in view of your officer's recommendation for approval, we respectfully request that the application be approved. Thank you very much. Questions for Mr. Hanna? Councillor Court, followed by Councillor Konexko. Good evening. Um, can you tell me whether the lighting is on all night or is it switched? 
I believe that the lighting would be uh, potentially uh, 24 7 to depend on the nature of the occupier that would um, uh, take the site. Again, that's not confirmed, um, but that's the detail that I'm aware of. Okay. Can I, can I next go? Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask why the lighting scheme wasn't included as part of the original planning application from last year? Um, so um, that's not an answer I can directly um, sort of um, give an answer to. Um, so it's down to the sort of applicant at the time. Um, however, it's obviously as you know, construction is going up for the site. Um, the lighting spec was agreed um, to the part of the sort of applicant's technical team, and then at that point, the application came forward. Any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Hanna. You return to the public seats. Um, if you could have a quick wipe down it would be appreciated questions to officers no debate in that case i will move the recommendation sorry um and seconded by councillor frost there's no one for debates so moved and seconded for approval those in favor and that is everybody Thank you. Sue. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm that the application is approved subject to the conditions in the committee report. Right. Item 7, Greenlands Nursery, 3A, Hackwood Road, Hackwood Lane, sorry, Cliddeston. Um, Gemma. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Item 7 seeks the variation of Condition 1 of a previous planning consent which granted the erection of three detached dwellings at Greenlands Nursery, Hackwood Road. The variation would allow alterations to Plot 1 to include accommodation in the roof space and the proposal would also include the insertion of roof lights. In terms of update, members are advised that the incorrect elevations were included on page 263 of the agenda for clarification, it's just that the northern and southern elevations are labelled incorrectly and they just need to be flipped around. To confirm, the proposed side roof light is proposed within the, within the southern roof slope. It's also confirmed that the recommended pre-commencement conditions have been agreed by the agent. And lastly, it's advised that there was a drafting error to condition two on page 255 of the agenda and the amended wording is set out for you there. And that's simply to secure uh, the implementation of the development within three years of the date of the original consent. The application is before you this evening due to the number of objections received and the application is recommended for approval. Thank you Gemma. Um, it would appear that we don't have Justin Twain or Martin Runsey in the building. No, they're, not They're not here. In that case, Councillor Raphael. Mm. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to address the meeting. Well, we're on opposite teams this time. Um, the local residents don't like it and the officers do. It's funny that, isn't it? We've heard that tune before. Uh, uh, let's, let's just have a look, can we, at the proposed site plan because I think it's quite um, uh, instructive and, and inform you of what we have. So at the moment, it's a two-bedroomed, mm, I don't know, you could call it a bungalow um, at the moment. And if you look at the size of the green area, uh, in comparison, certainly to the east, which is the, the, to the right, it's less than the size of the property. And there's a little bit under the tree. Uh, um, now, you might say when you look at this, well, it looks like a, a, um, a, a, a property for a couple um, or so, it certainly a, a, might be a property for a single person. Not very good on mobility, if you look at it, because it's got stairs in the middle, because bungalows tend to be great for people with mobility issues or, or age. Um, but unfortunately, this one's decided to put some stairs in the middle between the, the, the master bedroom at the top on the left, uh, that's if I understand, and the bathroom. Um, that's if I've got it right, anyway. Uh, and then some other stairs uh, within there um, in any event. Now. What this plans to do is put a third bedroom in, in the roof. And this now turns it into a family house. 
because there's a pressure on people to get family homes and people will buy this because it'd be a bit cheaper uh, because of the size of the plot and it becomes a family home. So you're now looking at the garden that's potentially smaller than the actual dwelling being appropriate for a family uh, home. Uh, it's, and that's the first issue I want to raise you. The second one is the one that the, on, on the online submissions the window that is this big gable window that's going to be put in in the um, roof on the east picture on your elevations, not that that com picture is completely irrelevant. I don't know what that's up for. Um, uh, the east picture, uh, the resident who lives in the plot to the south uh, has demonstrated uh, that that big window uh, will remove their privacy from their garden. So at the moment, whatever, whatever one might think about these properties being squeezed in there in the first place, that's done, that's happened, that can happen, blah, blah. But giving them views out the roof over other people's gardens is, um, is, is it's just not, it's not, it's just not fair, is it? I mean, it's not right. You, you've got quiet enjoyment of your own property. You can sit in your deck chair and then someone's going to be oogling you out of their bedroom. Or more importantly, you can look into their bedroom. That's not particularly helpful for them. So there's two issues that I'm bringing to, to, to you. First, You have one minute. Thank you. Just two issues. Firstly, it's overdevelopment, turning it into a family house in such a small plot. And secondly, there's a fundamental loss of privacy, uh, which means the design is bad and, and it should be refused on those two bases. And that's why there's all the objections. So I urge you to refuse it. Thank you. Questions for the councillor. Councillor Howard Sorrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, could you just confirm, do, do you mean downlands is the one where the overlooking is going to be the issue? Uh, yes, that's right. And online, sorry. Online, they did the sort of splay, so it obviously wasn't 180 degrees looking around, but just with a slight angle. And the, the vast majority of the garden of downlands, which you can now see on there, um, because because the window is 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 on the right hand side of the property. I don't know. Have you got the red dot? Go on, stick the red dot on it. There we are. Uh, no, no, not that property. Th th this one. That's it. That's it. So that window, if you if you if you add it out, not 180 degrees, but something like I don't know, 160, you can see it's going to come straight across the garden. And they and they were they were complaining about the fact they got patio and everything downstairs on the on the, the, the bit that's going off the bottom that faces out that way and and so they, they drew it up I, it's a shame it's not on the screen for you to see but uh, that that that's why they and obviously others in the parish council all jump up and down saying this is just monstrous sorry that's not a planning word is it any more questions for the councillor. No. Thank you, Councillor Raphael. Questions from officers. Councillor Frost. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering with the with plot one. At the moment, obviously the garden is big enough for a two bedroom bungalow. Okay. Is it big enough for a three bedroom house? Thank you. Um, the assessment um, is set out, um, if I just find the page number, um, on page 249, um, it is considered that the um, shape and size of that amenity space um, would be sufficient to meet the recreational and domestic needs for the future occupants for across the entire um, originally consented scene and by virtue of this amendment, so yes. Thank you. Councillor Connects go, followed by Councillor Connects. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I note Councillor Raffel's concerns about the, uh, the, the potential loss of privacy, but I equally look at on the reasons for approval on page 239. Reason number two states very clearly the proposed development would not result in, any, in, in an undue loss of privacy or cause undue overlooking. So I, I'm just wondering how we can square those two, given we've got one side saying it will, one side saying it won't. Thank you. Um, 
I would have to refer you again to the impact on neighbouring amenities section of the report, which is on page 249. That sets out the officer's assessment of the, um, of the application and the amendments sought. In terms of the roof light, um, due to its siting um, within within the roof and with a condition for that to be obscure glaze, it's considered that that wouldn't give rise to any adverse impacts. And the additional first floor window on the eastern elevation, um, it's considered by officers that any views would be at a obscure angle. There are there is also dense vegetation along that southern boundary, um, which would be retained as part of the development, and I think can be viewed um, in some of the pictures. Thank you, Councillor Ganesh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, going back to Councillor Frost's question about the suitability or the space for a three-bed house, do you have that in square feet uh, once it's uh, uh, approved? Um, the the requirement is that um, for three-bedroom properties, um, according to the SPD, um, gardens should measure 60 square metres, but unfortunately I, I don't have the measurement exactly before me within the report of what this, this garden actually does measure. Um, but the officer has assessed it and said that it, it does meet that requirement. Thank you. Any, any more questions for the officers? In that case, debate. Councillor Frost. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I, I really don't like that window in the eastern side, OK? But I have to bow to officers' superior knowledge of planning laws. And if you say that the angle is, is, is acute enough uh, to, uh, to maintain privacy and prevent overlooking, then... then I have to go with it. Um, I personally would like to see it uh, uh, obscured, but then again, if that was to happen, it wouldn't be a particularly nice bedroom. So I can understand the reasons for, for that to happen. Um, so, so again, I, I would like to hear what other people uh, in the committee uh, have to say about this, but uh, uh, I am minded to approve the application subject to the conditions listed at the end of the report. And I'll do that now for the to eliminate doubt. Councillor Tilbury, followed by Councillor Howard Sold. Yeah, I think just to clarify, I believe it is obscure glass. It's condition seventeen. So, and it is. I uh, given given the height, I think you'd have a job to stick. I mean, you could. Uh, it doesn't stop you open the window and gawping at your neighbours if people are so inclined. But yeah. generally, find an excuse to do that if they want anyway. But I mean, I think. But it is actually on the condition. We'll bring an officer in on that one. Just to confirm, um, condition 17 um, secures that the roof light within the southern elevation would be obscure glazed. Um, the condition doesn't secure it for the um, proposed first floor uh, window in the eastern elevation. Um, that was considered um, by officers to be unreasonable considering it would be a primary window serving a habitable room. Councillor Howard Sorrell. I, I think this application is fine. I'm happy to second. There, there's plenty of houses in the world where you can see your neighbour's garden as long as you can't see into their bedroom. That's the main thing. So, Thank you for that. Um, it's been moved and seconded. But before we go to the vote, on this window, <laughs> controversial window, could we put a condition on it? Because as I look at it on plan, if somebody's looking out of the window... It is a very oblique angle to overlook the garden, but you could look, potentially lean out of the window. Could we put a condition on uh, to restrict the opening of that window so that leaning out of it would not be possible? Sorry. Um, it, well, you, you, you could possibly... I don't think you'd want... It would be reasonable, given it's uh, the, the, the primary window to that, to that bedroom, to say that you couldn't open the window at all. I mean, you might want to say that it should be kind of just open the top so you can get some air in but I, I um, you know we've made our assessment we think that would be unreasonable I mean um, we think that there, that there is no adverse um, adver adverse impact in terms of um, immunity for adjoining properties from this window 
Um, and then, of course, you know, if you put an unreasonable condition on it, it can be um, appealed against. Okay, we'll leave that. We'll leave that out. Yeah, I agree with what you said. Yeah. Right, moved and seconded for approval. Those in favour? Yeah, um, all except Sven. And those against? Um, um, Councillor Goderson is abstaining. And that concludes our meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you to the officers. And uh, we meet again next year, so hopefully everybody has a happy Christmas, if we're allowed one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>